Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this talk. I'm Sherif Mamoulis. I'm a software architect for intelligent systems at Siemens. And this morning, I will be talking about the Edge Federation and its key role as a driver for environmental data processing. Um, and for that, I will be first talking about what is a cloud federation, how it's defined by the National Institute of Standard and Technology, NIST. And I will then dig into some use cases where I will mainly highlight how the federation can be implemented in different kinds of settings and environments to enable a new generation of distributed data processing. Uh, the, a cloud, a private cloud deployment, it's also uh, falls in this category. So uh, the, the current definition, it's mainly uh, a combination between private or public clouds and private cloud might be an edge network or an edge uh, or deployed at the, the edge. And the main objective is to pre provide an environment to form a general or a mission-specific federated com a community cloud. In other words, the federation uh, makes or uses the interoperability or uh, puts the basis for an interoperability among different private or public cloud deployments in such a way that they could uh, build uh, or they could share their resources among each other. And by that, uh, leverage your benefits from more processing power for to process data and uh, and to make the use of the available resources. Now, this the federation is mainly designed as three levels of federation. First one is federation usage claim, where you have a high level federation composed, for example, from uh, of the federation administrator and users, services, and uh, all the authorizations of privacy and so on are managed at this abstraction level. However, the different services are coming from a level below, where you have the different environments, for example, private cloud deployment as a local government in a city, or for example, a deployment in a farm in a rural area with a mini data center or a micro data center deployed over there. But the high level uh, uh, rules and uh, build a seek route for a trust that is propagated down to the different locations so they can concretely make use of their uh, mutual resources as authorized by the policy. The architecture is mainly an extension of the current cloud architecture by a highlight of federation that like there is an operator for every federation, there is a manager for every federation, and there are multiple instances that contain specific membership management, specific policy management, resources management, and so on and so forth. And here you can imagine that mainly as data coming from weather sensors, data coming from sensors that are, uh, that probes the, some farms, and data coming from other uh, information sources like local government, and all that is made available through the federation through, through the different participants. Uh, now, the question is, Okay, we do have this federation, but still how different entities that might or might not have a, a previous relation among each other could uh, collaborate? And the answer, it's mainly two models or mainly two models. First one is a peer-to-peer -peer model. 
and you can imagine that in such a way that you have multiple farms. And every one of those farms have a machine that they consider as their edge platform and they're running some analysis from their meters or controlling their smart agriculture. Those different <clears throat> sites or farms in instance can establish a peer-to-peer -peer federation where they agree on the fact that they will share be in some of the data and potentially processing power among each other. And everyone, there is no one that has much control on the federation than the other. The, the next one is, maybe, is the third party centralized trust. And for this one, uh, there is the, the site or the, yeah, the federation site uh, is uh, there is a, a third party uh, part that is managing federation and the other sites are collaborating. And here we can imagine that for environmental monitoring and data processing as a government entity that is uh, providing some processing power and, the, and a service in such a way that it will collect different data source sources and be able to expose them and make use of them. So this might be simply collecting the data sources or extending that beyond in terms of uh, providing some processing power and data resources to this, this different site to make uh, to make use of. Now, uh, that being said, so far, we mainly talked about what a federation is and what is the architecture or the definition of the architecture of a cloud federation, including private clouds and deployments at the edge. So uh, next part of this presentation, we'll take a look at the use cases and how they can uh, foster the capability of running some data processing at the edge for environmental uh, processing. Uh, before uh, digging into uh, specific use cases, let's uh, just take a quick look at the current architecture versus the federation, where the current, current architecture, independent if it's manufacturing or smart agriculture or other aspects, it's most of the time uh, a kind of hierarchy starting from a public cloud to an edge platform or a kind of private cloud at the edge connected to the different samples. It is missing this horizontal connectivity between the different nodes and the interoperability capabilities that goes well with it. On the right hand side, it's the same kind of deployment, however, considering the interaction that might be possible for federation. If we consider that those nodes are processing some, some data collected from different sensors, uh, we can leverage processing GPU and hardware acceleration on different locations as available and share data and make everyone benefiting from that. And this is uh, more true uh, in environmental um, monitoring than in other fields. Because in an industrial envi environment, sharing the data is much less crucial and sometimes uh, not or unwanted in like to keep some disinformation uh, private. But for environmental data, uh, there is a, a, a high level perception that is built on some localized processing is beneficial for everyone. And um, let's take uh, the next example, which is uh, to, fight, to fight the diseases in other sort area. This concept started mainly with, uh, with Asan and other co colleagues by looking at some technologies like uh, to address the, the, the like, like NDN named data networking, kind of connectivities to build some um, isolated or to bring connectivity to some rural areas and keep the bridge between those rural areas of farms and uh, and the cities and towns that are nearby. Uh, and the idea would be to share the information and internet access between those different uh, locations while keeping their independence. Now, 
If we consider that in terms of federation, that makes a lot of sense in such a way that you can consider the orange or the yellow and the blue uh, circles here in the top network coverage either with Wi-Fi or LoRa uh, at um, at different location or different far farms, but they still build a peer-to-peer -peer federation among them in such a way that they can share some power, some processing power to figure out from the images that are coming from the leaves if there is a disease or not. That reduces the upfront envir envir in investment. Now, we could extend that to some other locations that are physically distanced to them with, with few miles and consider with participation of the government that the government it would be the third party uh, trust, the, the centralized trust party and will collect information coming from those different farms and share the information back with every one of those in such a way that one can benefit from the information from off for the others and the government can have accurate info information about uh, the state or any environmental threat that is uh, that is coming and that is obviously not only limited to fighting specific diseases but also in terms of weather and change in terms of weather and in terms of composition of the soil and so on and so forth so uh, this is mainly for for this part and the highlight here again is that this federation or those information can be shared among the different uh, uh, federations or different participants, the governments, and that doesn't mean that we leverage a centralized cloud. That means that simply that this centralized cloud needs to be part of the federation, and this is what I will talk about in not this slide, but the one after I, I believe. Now, talking about the, the data processing, most of the time, uh, machine learning showed its capability to bring a lot of uh, a lot of power and enable new use cases, especially associated to machine v v and data processing for time series. Now, leveraging that, uh, we can if you have a camera and looking at your field, you have a localized vis visibility or perception that says what happens in your own location. However, uh, for env environmental data processing, it's important to know the, or to have an information or a perception as a really larger scale, to be able to better pre predict what happens. For that, uh, we here with the federation, we can talk about a federated perception where every farm is looking for its own resources but, but when a farm needs much more resources or the government needs to access to much more information, we introduce this many sources perception, which can be implemented as, which can be enabled by the federation in such a way that it will collect pre-processed data from every data source and build this high level perception and link with backend services and cloud services in order to visualize this data and potentially have this visualization also um, federated, like for the machine learning algorithms that might be deployed. And this is a way that also manage or enable sharing different, uh, different hardware acceleration capabilities in such a way that some workloads, for example, AI, needs GPU. So if there is a AI specific workload, then there is an available GPU in one of the federa of the participants of the federation. Those capabilities can be leveraged and the results can be exposed simply as resources to the rest of the federation. One of the big challenges that happens, and here in another note regarding the distributed automation of ad field, is the federation and especially when you are talking about the the environmental uh, data processing the devices that are on sensors that are used for this monitoring 
team on different shape and form connecting with different protocols. As soon as these two communicate with Madbus and you have a third one communicating with uh, with BACnet. All those are different standard protocols for those de devices. Most of the time, every one of them connects to its own cloud backend. For example, Schemans has its MindSphere, different cloud provider are different cloud solutions. But it makes it difficult to build or to build that together in order to put uh, a sense of it at a larger scale. And here I'm iterating again about the main uh, key point of this talk is that the environmental data processing cannot be localized to one farm or one town or something at that scale. We need to push it in such a way that it uh, scales to countries and even be beyond to have enough prediction and the infrastructure that is needed for that, the complex of the devices and standards and whatnot makes it difficult to standardize that everywhere. Though the federation manager can manage that and can um, enable the access to those different resources on different locations and allows to mutualize those resources to the benefit of the general commun community. Uh, and last but not least, regarding the, the scalability point, uh, these different layers of uh, connectivity, and here I'm giving some example of uh, some cloud providers that are, uh, uh, that are providing some strong services regarding the IoT. For those kind of deployment, you have your service, for example, the service that will allow you to do to build free app prediction, either running at a public cloud or running at the edge. Those kind of uh, services need to be to make sense out of specific data using specific protocols. You cannot assume that one component can manage all that. The federation allows clearly defined interfaces and also a homogenization and a push toward uh, or the fostering the, the interoperability between those different Basis, and then that would be the key that enables this high level perception of the environment or the data processing for the environment. Uh, and I believe that that's the end of my talk. I hope that I, I, I successfully introduced some of these notions regarding what the uh, federation is, uh, what are the technical challenges, even if they didn't about the functional use cases i tried maybe to focus about the technical challenges that might be addressed by the federation in order to accelerate this data monitoring at a really large scale um, to find some more information about the cloud federation please feel free to consult the website for the ieee p2302 working group for the intercloud or reach out to them by on their address email. Um, again, um, Dr. Sharif Mahmoudi, software architect for, CIMA, for intelligent system at Siemens Technology US. And I would be happy to answer any of your questions. With that, thank you very much. And I hope that you will enjoy the rest of your day in this conference. Thanks. Okay, well, that's really fascinating presentation. Uh, exploring environmental data processing and uh, different ways to monitor this and appropriately uh, share and distribute information with um, the right kind of technologies. So uh, I'd like to um, ask if Rocio and Hassan could uh, potentially field the discussion or the, uh, co moderate this discussion. But I do know there is one question on the perception level um, from. Uh, Mamoru Laminba, he said, do you consider the logical data scheme if to access the data from different sources? How, how do things work? Okay, so I, I, I can just uh, give uh, an educated guess maybe <laughs> to, to this. Uh, and uh, 
I mean, the question is, is very good, of, of, of course. If you are uh, collecting from different uh, sources, you have to structure the data somehow. So I am uh, guessing that there is certainly a logical data schema. What they are using, I uh, wouldn't be able to say. But uh, I mean, the, my guess to the, to the question is a yes. Uh, Mamoto, you're able to speak if you'd like to mention, say anything further, extra extrapolate further. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, yes, I my my video doesn't work, but of course, I mean, uh, I guess I don't know if you if you hear me. Yes. Okay. I mean, yes. Um, the, so the the guess the guess answer from from Asan. I mean, is uh, is well see because when um, so if we have a look on the federate uh, um, level, uh, there is somehow a need to set uh, a way to integrate the data from different sources because if we if we have a look on the on the architecture, there is different sources where we collect data and somehow someone sometime wanna access to all the data. Uh, through a kind of uniform view and to set that uniform view somehow we need uh, yes uh, a, a logical schema or a physical schema it, it depends on how we uh, how we design our integrate uh, view uh, if we consider we have a centralized uh, a site where we integrate everything then we will set a physical uh, physical integration schema. Um, otherwise, we will use a, a logical schema. So yes. So in this kind of architecture, it's really worth it to to take into account how to integrate uh, the data from different sources. And for yeah. those who are outside of your field, do you mind just mentioning a little bit more about the application in in the work that you do with this um, in in your particular Study context. Sorry? Do you mind explaining a little bit for those who are outside of your field what would be, um, in what context do you apply this? Okay. Let's yes. start. Go, go, go Lamento. Go, go, go ahead, Asan. Yeah, I, I was, uh, for example, yesterday I was uh, talking about uh, uh, helping agriculture actually to. Uh, let's say, know what is the state of their culture at any given time by having, let's say, drones fly uh, above the field, take pictures, and then you can do a 2D reconstruction of the pictures and analyze the, 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 the color of the plants. And then from there, you can determine, for example, if in some spot, in your field, the plants are sick or they need more water and so on. But to be able to do that, you need some computing power. Yes. And, and, and the, the, we, so how do we do computing? Most of the time we go to the cloud, but the cloud is far away from the, 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 the farmers. They don't have uh, that connectivity. So we, we build the edge which is a cloud that we bring closer to the users so that we can do those kind of computation. But now you have several edges. Mm -hmm. And uh, so one way to make better use of it is to federate them so that yeah. you can pull from the different edges to have even more information. So that's what Sharif was uh, trying to do in his, uh, in his work. And so agriculture is one application. You can have many other applications actually in the health sector. Yes, so, of yeah. Yes, of course. I mean, uh, but but the, the, main, the main the main the main question here is maybe when you when you pull up and you federate uh, edges, so different edges, how 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 you how um, you come up with this federate uh, things. Uh, how how you combine information from different edges? Uh, yes, yes. Is there any 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 existing techniques or approach that allow to do that? Uh, 
and what what kind of challenges it will uh, it, it will lead in terms of issues. I mean, I guess there there are some some interesting challenges that can be investigated in that uh, in that point. Yes, definitely. That, that definitely. Relates to many other sectors, so in terms of how you validate different sources of information and find um, mean across uh, multiple data points. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, uh, I think that's the case, yes. So, yeah, uh, and and of course you are federating from different places, uh, so uh, having some structure would help actually in the processing later. I think that that's what uh, Lamin was alluding to. There is a question, uh, Rocio, about open data, uh, which is, I mean, a very good question actually. Uh, but very important actually, and I think that there is a lot of uh, advocacy today for open data. Uh, so it it could be very important actually, even if for these federated systems. Actually, if we come back to what Lamin was saying, if we 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 do these edges with some structure, and the data is open, I think that it facilitate access. And, and and give actually uh, better opportunities to everybody. So I, I, I believe that open data is, is very key here, uh, I mean, to Rocio's point. And then I see we have another question from Adam. How do you deal with the issues of, yeah, the, the integration and security? Yeah, so, so, so uh, Lamin was saying uh, that uh, we need, there are some open, uh, research questions here, and uh, that's certainly one part of it. For example, if we if we want to do open data, so we are uh, doing some measurement, let's say, in someone's field, uh, in someone's farm, and well, uh, uh, what are the important or the private information that needs to be protected, and how do we protect it? So those are questions that we need to come up with, uh, with these answers. So uh, yes, I think that uh, when we talk about uh, making it more accessible, then the privacy and security becomes an issue, and uh, definitely an open uh, open uh, research uh, uh, area comes up, and and I think that it comes back to the idea of this conference where we are talking about let's say agriculture here how to help it but we see that there is some uh, privacy so some people doing working on security coming into the in, into the play people doing communication system coming into the play and if we dig deeper people who do economics will be because this federation federated system needs to be sustainable they need to be affordable, and we have to do it in a way that protects the environment. So if we dig deeper, we come back again to the team of this conference, where you know, basically when you want to solve one problem, you need uh, people from different skills to, to, to join a forward and, and work on it. I also see that there's a question from Maimona. Perhaps, um, Maimona, you could raise the question verbally, if you switch on your mic. So I think it's also what Rocio was saying. Um, I I know that it has been pointed out several times in Intersol that the underserved areas problem, um, uh, one of the bottleneck of solving this problem is knowing what is the problem, so collecting data. So I was wondering if this is both for uh, collecting data to solve, to have multiple points where we are able to collect all types of data, environmental and all types of data, or is this is just for uh, improving the, um, um, I don't know if force is a good way to say it, the force we have to process data. Oh, so if you see one of the slides actually, uh, Sharif was showing uh, drones with, that are equipped with uh, sensors. And the role of those is, I mean, uh, twofold. 
first they will collect the data, data and of course transport it into the edge. So this is a very good uh, tool actually to collect environmental data. And, and uh, actually by combining with those drones that can access actually uh, places where people cannot easily access. You can have, you can hope actually having uh, much, much more data. So yes, I, this is providing both the collect and the computational power that is needed for, for environmental data. So we have one more question and that's from Adam. Adam, would you like to ask? Sure, I just didn't mute myself. <clears throat> yeah, so I was just thinking, Asan, just uh, you know, the use of the sort of Internet of Things and um, edge computing. Uh, can you speak a little bit about how that might be used in the context of increasing urbanization in the African context and the kind of, I guess, move towards more smart city developments and how that federated edge computing would be used in that context? Yeah, yeah, so so I, I, I need to <laughs> to tell you that uh, I'm trying to respond to Sharif's question. So Sharif is, uh, <laughs> but anyway, I, I just give my, so, so when we talk about smart city, uh, there is a heavy use of IoT devices. And uh, of course, the data that we collect with those IoT devices need to be processed and uh, uh, needs to be completed and, and we need to mine the data to get some insight uh, about how to make our cities better. So uh, just think about a city uh, having its uh, local uh, edge that uh, help actually that single city uh, in making it smart. So that's at the city level then if you think of the country level now we can take the different edges at the different cities actually and and federate them to have when a country level information so a, a, a second tier in, in, in terms of organization so I, I i mean i'm i'm saying the applications of this at the different uh, in different fields and i think that's smart city uh, development is another one actually that can benefit from these uh, federated edge uh, computing systems. Great. Well, I think that's a really good good place to end. Um, I also want to, to highlight that in our own research at the University of um, Cape Town and at the University of York, we're starting to explore um, er the areas in, in poor informal settlements on city boundaries in peri-urban areas. And a big interest in climate change, a very interesting synergy is to look at mobile phone towers and um, the, the frequency or cuts of um, connectivity in, in both mobile and internet connectivity associated with rainfall um, and how, especially in the long and uh, short rainfall seasons in East Africa, how that is, we can both map local um, climate data and, and precipitation um, as, as uh, predict the likelihood of extreme events. So there's a lot of synergies across these different areas of work. So now I would like to welcome uh, the first plenary of the day. Right. Okay. Well, um, thank you everybody for joining us today. 
Um, well, it's been one year since we postponed the previous uh, conference uh, because COVID hit. In fact, uh, one of our panelists had had to excuse themselves because um, they're dealing with you know, COVID-related issues at home, which are quite serious. Uh, also with uh, Akshay, um, but perhaps that gives us a little bit more time to get into our topic today. Um, I would like to uh, in sort of welcome Jess and Jan. I believe Lucy, uh, I'm not sure if Lucy's arrived today. Uh, I have just called the office. Um, I expect that she'll come online. So let me start by just going through the, you know, the, the brief resume of each of the uh, panelists so that we have a little bit of context. Um, so Lucy really, you know, in this discussion about the, the social and ecological compact, what is the role of the private sector? Lucy was really uh, somebody who's very interesting in terms of her um, engagement with the private sector. Uh, she's the chief executive officer of Pan-African Agribusiness and Agro-Industry Consortium, Pan-AAC, a Pan-African private sector organization represented across the continent in various countries, created to support the African agribusiness through enhanced productivity and competitiveness in the regional and global markets. Lucy is also the coordinator of the Kenya Agribusiness and Agri-Industry Alliance, uh, the national chapter of Pan-AAC. She's a social scientist with a master's degree in strategy and business management. She's currently a member of the recently formed task force by African Union to support the organization of regional agribusiness platform for mobilizing this and supporting the domestic private sector in Africa, both nationally and con uh, across the continent. She has also served as a member of the advisory council that was tasked with guiding the UNDP report of inclusive business model. Lucy is also an accomplished entrepreneur and trades in the horticultural products, tea and herbs. Notably, she was the first person to pack African herbs in Kenya and sell them to the local retail shops dominated by imported herbs. She serves in the board of the Micro Small Enterprises Authority, the only institution mandated under the Acts of the Parliament Authority in supporting the development of the below pyramid of companies in Kenya. Then we have Jan. Uh, Jan, welcome. Um, Jan is a Belgian citizen living in Kenya since 1997 and has an MSc in agriculture with specialization in forestry from Ghent University uh, and teaching qualification in, uh, at, from Ghent University from 1980. He's a forester and agronomist with 40 years of experience in management and technical implementation of locally and internationally financed projects in Europe, Africa, South America, and Asia. After a brief stint in the Belgian Forestry Department, employment in international aid, FAO, Belgium Technical Cooperation, and since 2006, working for Better Globe Forestry with headquarters in Nairobi, in the capacity as Executive Director of Forestry, overseeing plantation forestry and outgrow programs for high value tree species in Kenya and Northern Uganda. Known for promoting an indigenous mahogany tree species, Melia, um, apt to grow profitably in semi arid, -arid countryside. Better Globe's farmers programs currently cover 17,000 farmers and plants trees in agroforestry layout, coordinating the Green Initiative Challenge with the Ken Jen Foundation and the Farage Holson, an award winning program for tree planting and with, with schools in dry areas. He's the founding editor and editor in chief of Meeting Magazine, a high quality quarterly with information on forestry uh, in the East African region, with editorial boards in Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania. He's been the director of Kabezi Farm, and he's producing horticulture crops, man mainly mangoes, in a 40 acre, acre farm in Southeast Kenya. And then finally, uh, Jess, welcome to you. Jess uh, is part of ICLEI's City Biodiversity Center, as well as ICLEI's Africa Climate Change and Resilience Team. 
She has a background in atmospheric science um, with a specialized knowledge of climate challenge and its relationship with the sustainable approach to development. She has experience working with and for local governments, working to improve urban human well being, build climate resilience, strengthen local sustainability, and produce the urban natural asset base in cities through influencing development policies and planning systems. Okay. <laughs> and you so, have Sharif. Um, uh, you have Sharif with you now. Hi, Sharif. Welcome to you. Hey, uh, thank you. Hey. Glad, glad you could make it. We thought the presentation was very interesting. Thank you so much. I'm really glad to be here with you. So, Sharif, just to let you know, you are joining us on the second panel discussion today. So, after your presentation, we um, are adding you to our group. And the conversation today is the social and ecological compact and what is the role of the private sector. And I think that we can really build uh, your experience into the discussion today quite nicely. Um, I, so maybe I'll just start with some of the questions and then we can tie back into, um, you know, into this larger topic around um, in, intelligent assets and perhaps even how we can think about intelligent assets uh, through intelligent environmental assets. And I think this perhaps is a question is to kind of make the connection between um, cities and, and nature. So um, perhaps if Lucy is not here, I, let, let me just give a quick, broad, a very short um, introduction on what the topic was today. Um, the context, when considering where to begin with the panel discussion on a social and ecological compact, we ask, what is the private sector's role? Um, in the private sector, individuals typically own and drive production within capital economies and across the global market system, whether it's land, labor, capital goods, enterprise, or finance. In this economic model, we cannot divorce land and its management from these production factors, including natural resource extraction, which as a result directly impacts localized ecologies as, and the public at large. One of the contradictions in this market system is that it tends to fracture the landscape through individualized control on land ownership, which by its nature seems counterproductive to the interconnected, interrelated, and interdependent ecological or social systems. So while specific social ecological systems operate across territories, private ownership and rural urban production systems not necessarily support integration of a healthy environment landscape. And I can, there, were, there were some additional questions there, but I think the main question that then comes from this is like, what are the tools at our disposal that can improve the current market economies, ecological and social compact? And perhaps, you know, um, what are the enablers that can improve that land stewardship and what might clear a social ecological systems integration within these market economies and the associated production landscapes look like? So today I really wanted to just begin by just asking, you know, the panelists um, just a simple question, just to you know, ask in their day-to-day -day work, you know, in your day-to-day -day work, what comes first, people or the environment? <laughs> and uh, you know, if if um, Jan, we could start with you. you know, what's the emphasis with your forestry enterprise? And you're welcome to switch on your microphone. Um, and please also switch on your video or the panelists. I think you're back on mute. So, Jan, hi. Good morning. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Nice to be here. Nice for the invitation. Thank From you. your uh, introduction uh, of uh, myself, um, it is clear that I'm working for a forestry company. So actually we are land-based, we work with natural resources. And from a company that started doing classic forestry work with classic plantations where you plant blocks of trees, we moved into agroforestry and work with farmers. This started five years ago. Today we work indeed with many thousands of farmers, 17,000 combined in 
Kenya and Uganda. And uh, I can answer your question or one of the many questions that you have asked. It is people that come first. You cannot get around it. Um, uh, the technical part does not come first. It is the social organization and the cohesion of the people that are in the countryside with whom you work that absolutely come on the first place. If you cannot uh, get uh, social structures into place, especially when you're working with crops like trees, which is uh, long-term crops, we are not counting on harvesting any trees in less than a period of 15 years. It is clear that you need to create some social stability without which you will never achieve your uh, first um, objective, which is to survive as a private company. As a private company, your only sustainability is your profit. So uh, when you take the people into account, you take your own sustainability and your own survival into account. Very interesting. Thanks, Jan. Um, Jess, do you have uh, your thoughts on that? Yeah, and thanks for including us in this. Um, yeah, I think I got into this field because ultimately environment came first for me in the beginning, but in practice, that's completely shifted. So I completely agree with Jan. Um, it's a balance between the two. And I do think sometimes the narrative of which comes first is a little bit complicated. Um, it's like an egg in, egg in the chicken kind of story. Um, it's really about trade off. Sometimes environment must come first, sometimes people must, but it's really about working together and the balance between those two kind of like sectors with finance as a third. I, I guess, uh, Sharif, you, you should have the interesting answer. What What's your thoughts on that? What comes first, uh, the social and ecological compact? Would that be people or the environment? Uh, uh, the most of uh, the most interesting thing is to have uh, is to have both. Uh, obviously, if we have to make a choice, uh, people definitely came first. But most of the time, we at, we try to achieve uh, or try to achieve both at the same time or progress on both of them. I'm, I'm not involved at that level. I'm more coming to that from a data collection point of view. So I guess I would be uh, quite. Uh, uh, more helpful at that level, but in general, in terms of strategy, uh, we try to achieve both uh, of them at the same time, or at least as much as we could. Thanks. Um, I, I'm going to sort of maybe just spin the day around a little bit with the new panelists. Um, you know, just on this idea with data collection, but before we get to the actual collection, this experience, you know, Jan, you've had many years of experience in the field and your Better Globe Forestry has really interesting programs where you're supporting farmers, thousands and thousands of farmers. And I mean, that, that, this, this um, experience that you've gained over time with this particular program of uh, supporting agroforestry with local farmers, can you talk to that a little bit? Could you... Um, you know, just speak to the type of knowledge that you've um, developed over time on that particular program. Um, in Kenya... Uh, yeah, I think... It, so, it, yeah, go ahead. In Kenya, we uh, had to develop, to develop a group approach in which uh, uh, we followed actually a traditional system where people come together in so-called self-help groups, which uh, we made full use of. And uh, we put these groups into loads of training sessions about planting trees. But quickly we understood that the planting of the trees uh, would not work on its own without a more holistic farm approach. Meaning that uh, you cannot only focus on one long-term investment, you have to see the farm in its whole ecological context. And uh, this is mostly landscape restoration. And it boils down to soil and water conservation and teachings about um, dry land. Uh, yeah, I, I forgot to mention in Kenya, we work really in dry lands from a mean annual rainfall of 400 millimeters to something like uh, 750 millimeters. 
En this is really not much. You are on the equator. There is a lot of heat. There is a lot of evaporation. So water is a key factor. And if you want to get the people with you, you have to address their own needs. And this is survival. This is production of food. And we work in quite a degraded environment. A lot of the semi arid lands of Kenya are completely degraded by mining the environment for biomass, which is used for energy and which is exported to cities, mostly in the form of charcoal. Uh, in Kenya, at least 60% of the total energy need is biomass that is mined from the local countryside, while in the neighboring countries like Uganda and Tanzania, it is even more than uh, 60%. So this uh, degraded environment, how do you restore it? And uh, the best restoration you can use is trapping water, is infiltration of water, is, is allowing the trees to grow back. And then there is maybe a surprising factor, which is not high technology at all, uh, which you have to, uh, uh, to control. It is livestock. Livestock uh, in dry areas is vital to people. It is part of their uh, coping system. And we're mentioning browsers like camels and goats. If people cannot be organized to control the livestock, well, the few regenerating trees will absolutely disappear and the degradation continues. So it is really about training and sensitization to be able to stop this negative spiral into more degradation. And on top of that, I could say, uh, as a private company, uh, you must have some kind of catalyst uh, factor where you use your influence as a company. When you're in the countryside as a company, you're aside the government, you're inevitably the biggest operator. Uh, there is maybe here and there a small organization that is trying to do something, but uh, you have to use your scale and you have to throw your weight around to catalyze your experiences into something that can have a wider impact. And then I'm talking towards uh, cooperation with research institutes, with universities, which we do, and which is then feeding back into practices that farmers can use. Great, and I think that's a great point to end on. Um, this, so this really idea of this um, knowledge in and around local systems, whether you're talking about peopling, um, whether you're talking about natural systems, um, perhaps just you know to, to try and pull all this information together. Obviously, there's a lot of complexity there. How important is it to identify key natural systems that are part of this in order to kind of mitigate this type of de degradation and then integrate it again with the social systems? Yeah, I mean, that's absolutely critical. If you think about to, to how urban areas or how cities first developed, first came to be, it's because of the natural features that were there, the rivers, the forests, mm -hmm. the things that gave the services to that actual city. Um, and so with urbanization and with um, multiple population growth and all the rest of it, we've kind of lost that original reason that a city is, is there. So we have to get back to the connection with that, with the environmental system. But obviously, because social is so important, and for example, like in Africa, a huge reliance on, on natural systems for livelihoods, uh, you have to have that, that link um, is key. And so, yeah, unpacking where your natural assets are, why they're important, and that social link um, is, is critical for, for not only protection, but also to, to manage social systems and make sure that enough food and health considerations and all the rest of it are, are very much integrated into future city planning. Yeah, I know it's when you look at Nairobi and you see the early um, planning, and of course, you, you know, the situation or the sightedness is relevant to water and and then the city grows. You know, the, I, this this connection really between what you picked up and between landscape and city. And I think what we're talking about with Jan's, Jan's experience with farming, and then bringing that back into the social um, aspect. Perhaps Sharif, you could talk to us in terms of making this connection between 
knowledge and intelligent systems, meaning in this case, perhaps smart systems where we're looking at the management of cities through intelligent assets. And if we're looking at, for instance, Jess's work on natural urban assets. So she would, for instance, look at a river ecosystem in a city and really use that as a basis as, as a natural asset. But really what we are looking at are the, the potential of connecting um, both natural and urban assets together. How would you uh, approach that from a, a sort of software um, system aspect, platform or structure? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, indeed, it's quite important. And I, I do believe that's one of the challenges is made when you are either modeling or collecting some information from uh, about sub. Uh, um, about the environment, most of the time, one of the challenges is how how you can uh, collect those data, recreate them, and and process them in such a way that you can enhance this awareness about the environmental in uh, the environmental context. And over there, it's mainly um, or uh, I spent some time looking at the the connectivity issues at that level and how we can uh, make uh, um, rural areas or areas that are far from sea, uh, sea cities accessible in terms of connectivity in such a way that we can uh, collect data from them easily. And some of the new networking technologies are quite useful, are quite useful at that level, including uh, ADN and DTN, which are uh, um, kind of extending uh, the, the network coverage. I guess here what I'm trying to say is that uh, um, I do believe that um, linking the data uh, was you are collecting as data in level of a CCT and be able to extend that or to link it with rural area, uh, build a kind of uh, awareness about what are the resources and how we can potentially use them better. So some push at that level to build those bridges and how to call it collection, I think that would be uh, that should be a focus on a lot of countries, especially with low net network or cellular network coverage. Mm -hmm. So just uh, who's responsible for these linkages? I mean, who do you see and who holds the, the, the data, the control you know, of that knowledge? I mean, where, where does that platform sit in your mind when you're making what you could call national strategic um, sort of objectives with making the connection for better uh, systems management or land management or asset management. I mean, who, where, where do you see that this um, knowledge sitting? I don't think that there is a, um, a well-defined standard about that, at least as far as I know. Uh, now, uh, most of the data is either owned by the governments or at a small scale for uh, for uh, like private company and small entities that are doing their own collection, like uh, farms or uh, companies that are exploiting that. the uh, the main uh, The main challenge is that when we are talking about this kind of visibility. Having a visibility about a land or a farm or a, you know like something small, I think it's not uh, it's not really giving the right uh, perception about what's happening. However, when all this data comes together, uh, this is where the, that comes much more va valuable. As you, you mentioned, we can start considering a perception or, or a visibility as a nation uh, level. Now, to go back to your question about uh, who owns this data and how it's being created, maybe the missing part is the communication infrastructure. As soon as you start to go uh, in, in the majority of big cities, there is a decent connection available that people can use, can make use of. But as far as you are, or uh, further you are going in terms of rural areas, this uh, 
communication infrastructure is not available no more. So those data, even if they are collected, they have to stay locally. So um, I guess um, two, mainly two aspects here. The first one is uh, being able to share this data and not hold to it, both from uh, local governments and also for farmers and other st stakeholders. It's one key point to enable this uh, um, awareness of what's happening in terms of data. The second point is uh, a networking infrastructure that can uh, foster uh, this data transfer and aggregation. That's also would be crucial uh, to, you know, like for different countries to push uh, the uh, visibility or, or environment visibility to another level. Okay. So, I mean, you know, just in terms of this data, um, Jan, with your forestry programs, uh, you, you have the support for uh, small farmers, uh, but you also have school programs. I mean, are you using data as a way to better manage um, your produce and environment and your water usage and the climate aspects that uh, you need to look out for? I mean, are you as better globe forestry engaged um, with any type of technology infrastructure? Uh, yes, we are in two fields. Uh, one is the counting of trees in the countryside for which we're having uh, a joint program with the University of Ghent that makes use of uh, satellite uh, imagery. Uh, and there, I must say, uh, satellite imagery, when you want to go down to a precision of, say, uh, 15 to 20 centimeters to be able to distinguish freshly planted seedlings, you hurt a barrier, which is the price of the, the imagery. Imagery is available from different sources, but it's not cheap. So this is one aspect where we really uh, do use data or, or in the process of using them. And the second aspect is to um, uh, uh, collect data on the ground with handheld devices like mobile phones, uh, where we develop our own software to count trees and to register different parameters. But there I have to make an observation. Uh, we do need this data. We do need these innovations. We do need technology. But Dieter, nothing replaces boots on the grounds. If you want to go towards real farmers' improvement, farmers, they do not listen to a phone. They do not want to, to go to all this technology that they don't understand. Farmers want to talk to somebody that they know. They want to talk to a representative of their own community. And this representative can convince them to use practices that will do what you want them to do in terms of landscape restoration and so on. Now, uh, this traditionally was called uh, extension, like you have agricultural extension services, forestry extension services, and all these things, which were in, uh, initiated in the colonial days, and then they were continued by uh, the newly independent governments. But the governments in the end, they can't pay for these things anymore. So then you have to get into an extension service which can finance itself or which is being funded by a company. Like in our case, we have our own extension service, although we also work together with the farmers' organizations, independent ones, which we try to help in this respect. So you must really see how you integrate the basic details, the basic work on the ground, where you do extension for farmers. And there is so many things that are evident, like I say, the right variety of tomatoes, the right variety of mangoes, uh, the right uh, species of tree planting. And you will meet in the countryside giant ignorance, which you cannot replace by a simple uh, program uh, that you can see on your phone, although you need both. So the link is that the people that teach the farmers these things, they have to have access to this data. So you need both things to have a real impact on the ground. Uh, that is the point I wanted to make. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Jan. Jess, um, yeah, back to you. Yeah. Obviously, we have been experiencing, well, we're experiencing two crises at the moment, but this global health crisis, 
and uh, we have um, the climate crisis. And of course, you know, the one is ever so sort of continuing and we're now looking at a critical decade. What, I mean, the, what are the opportunities that you're seeing at ICLEI with regards to this relationship, for instance, with COVID, I see you are responding at a governance um, you know, aspect within your institution. And, uh, and how do you see that as a way of kind of driving forward uh, new value systems with regards to the environment? It's a hard question to answer. So there's lots, lots I can say on it. Um, I think a third crisis is, is the biodiversity crisis. You know, we also we kind of manage, manage that one. Um, so a, a simple, non-complex answer is what, what we start to see in a lot of African cities is because of the lockdown, because of the the um, the way that the, the cities are kind of starting to function. What's what's kind of happening is people are starting to work in these sort of smaller communities, and um, which are much more manageable. And it's quite a, a great model actually to try and get natural assets closer to where people live, um, because there's this high reliance um, on livelihoods um, for natural assets, but also reduce like your transport. I mean, you mentioned about the transport issues in Nairobi because of the urban park. Um, so having these like smaller, smaller like sustainable communities that are very much in touch with their natural assets, they have their services and amenities very, very close to each other, is, is seems to be a very good viable solution in the current kind of global pandemic because it also prevents movement, it prevents that spread. Um, mm -hmm. And it's kind of like reconnecting people to pockets of cities. So um, that's that's what we see is kind of a natural formation that, that's coming out. And, and that's very interesting. We started to try and see how the small scale sustainable communities can be kind of uh, outscaled or reached out through policies and, and kind of procurement and planning um, in cities. So that's, that's kind of what we've been focusing on recently. Great. I mean, the, this idea of micro political organization, um, you know, the, the question though is that you still need to connect those smaller microsystems to larger sort of complex adaptive system thinking in a way. Like what are, what are these smaller systems connected to? And of course, if they're operating sustainably within their micro units, then the chances are that you're going to be more successful when you scale that up. Um, I think that's really something that one would look at. And maybe it comes back to Sh Sharif, you know, just to touch on um, your network systems, um, you know, with the cities that are more connected, but um, you do have these mesh systems that can be more localized. I don't know if I, you know, uh, you know, if you could maybe just speak to how we can kind of come back to Jan's point about, you know, linking this back to the ground, linking this back to people. We need, we, we think about data, we're thinking about, you know, the, collecting that information, but that information is kind of real-time information coming from people, you know, in this um, social and ecological compact. So maybe just speak from, you know, from the ground up how you see this connectivity working, uh, perhaps from a micro organization structure. Uh, yes, and um, I do believe that Jan's point is quite important. You can, um, I do believe that you can bring the best technology that you want if it doesn't have a clear uh, adoption path by those small far, uh, farmers, I think it's uh, it's not the technology will not be delivering its full potential. Uh, now, um, I think that is an aspect that um, has more some social or social economic, you know, like uh, requirements. I would believe and uh, constraints how to how to adopt them but assuming that the adoption is successful by local stakeholders and local partners that know uh, as Jan mentioned those farmers and can work with them uh, when we get to the data itself um, the, one of the main challenges is the stack is software stack that is used to collect this data there are uh, companies going with their own solution. I think Jan mentioned uh, a mobile um, a mobile application that they do have that can collect uh, in information, I believe. But uh, um, protocols that those applications are using depends on what software, if it's like homemade software or custom software or open stack or whatnot. Now, 
you feed all those streams to a central component that is supposed to aggregate that, and you end up with mainly two two challenges or two main challenges. The first one is how you can make sense of this data. If uh, farm A is measuring in Fahrenheit and farm B is measuring in Celsius, you cannot just do a pure addition or, you know, like a pure average and say that it's working in terms of number. You need some semantics associated to this data. Now, there are efforts, existing efforts, mainly by the W3C, that tries to have this semantic of the data available. So different sources, even if they are using different technological stack, can still be integrated together. The second main challenge is the scalability, which is if the system is working on uh, near real time, not even in hardcore real time, just in near real time, it becomes quite challenging to transmit all those data to a central component. It's too costly. Simply. Is that not where AI comes in? Sorry, like, I mean, are you looking at sort of intelligent, artificial intelligence as a way to speed that process up? Exactly. Processing, processing at the edge and especially, especially edge inference, uh, it's crucial and key here. And that's also one of the promises of the 5G networking. Uh, it's to be able to provide this kind of processing that is more close to the data sources. And yes, I do believe that uh, the processing at the, the edge and the and especially and the complex uh, at capability to run complex event processing at the edge would be a key for the integration and the acceleration of processing of those data. So, I mean, just to um, this edge intelligence, let's call it that <laughs> for a better word, but I mean, in a way, what we're looking for is a type of circularity where the user who's actually producing the knowledge gets the knowledge. And that's not necessarily the case. I mean, this data is obviously, as you say, the question is like, how do you mine that data? Um, and who, who, who really has um, sort of control of the systems? And I think that's something that we need to understand better. But perhaps just to bring it back to the environmental side, Jan, this, this circular system, circularity, I mean, as a, uh, as a farmer, you know, when you, you touched on water and, you know, the sort of question of aridity um, and how to deal with these dry landscapes. And of course, this intelligence about trying to restore landscapes. I mean, how, you know, like in the natural systems, it, it, we already have a type of circularity. I mean, how do you, in that restoration process, you know, see or how do you assist um, nature to be circular again? You know. In, Um, well, look, um, especially in East Africa, uh, it is drying out. Um, we can clearly see this. Uh, um, so uh, to bring nature back to something uh, that uh, will survive and uh, uh, that can sustain people, the main component is water. So you have to teach people about the water. Now, for starters, the data, um, a lot of data you don't have anymore. Uh, when you go to, uh, to computer programs that talk about water, they're mostly based on uh, uh, historical data uh, that are uh, maybe spanning a, a period of uh, 20, 30, 40 years. But these are all old data. Uh, and over the last 20, 30 day, uh, years, these meteorological stations that were supplying all this data have simply broken down. They don't exist anymore. So now uh, you have to start restoring the points where you take the data to be able to feed them into a system where you can do exact meteorological predictions of what is going on. Uh, I can see this in East Africa, that uh, in areas uh, you simply go down. Uh, we have a couple of uh, points as a company where you do, where we do measure uh, rainfall. And this rainfall, over the last 10, 15 years, uh, compared to historical um, uh, data, the rainfall has gone down by, by 10 to 15%. Uh, 
Now, where do you find this? Then you go to, to, to computer programs and they, they do trend analysis and all these things. And they're all based on this historical data that are not correct anymore. So when you talk about restoring the landscape, you talk about water. When you talk about water, you have no, we have to know what falls on the soil, but you don't know this anymore. So you have to go back to an effort to have ground fruiting stations where you can measure these things in a, in a modern way. It can be optimized. It doesn't have to be expensive. It's going to have to have security. The governments must agree to it. That's the kind of problem you're facing. So interesting. Thanks, Jan. Um, Jess, now before I open the questions up to the floor a little bit, um, water, <laughs> it's like, you know, it, it seems so important. And obviously, when you're looking at urban natural assets, you're probably thinking most likely or most often, in, you know, through river basin systems. Um, you know, and connecting rural landscape systems that are often upstream to the city. And then what we often see is that the city is releasing some of this water again and it's going back into the system. I mean, maybe you can just talk about your understanding of water and urban natural assets and give us an example, for instance, of work that you're doing in Dar es Salaam related to uh, UNA. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think the other added element what Jan was talking about what we don't know is changing is, is the reliance on those water infrastructure and how that's impacting. So it's not just your atmospheric changes and your climate changes, but it's also the demand and supply of water is also changing mm -hmm. based on, on urbanization rates. So that governance of water is actually also really, really important. Um, and that's a whole, a whole different discussion. But um, in terms of kind of an example of what, what we're doing, or, or maybe an example just to show the complexity of that, is in the Long Way. Um, the Long Way is actually named after their river, the Long Way River, which is the single source kind of point of water for that entire city. But because of this urbanization, coupled with environmental factors that Jan spoke about, um, we, we see the, the supply of water drastically reducing, so much so that um, the national government actually got the army involved and started putting the army in the rural areas to make sure that things wasn't deforestation occurring at a rapid rate because that often affects the, the river systems. So that just shows you the, the significance of what, what Jan was talking about in terms of environmental and this, this kind of urbanization governance social dynamic um, on, on river systems in Africa. It really is um, very, very complex. So, so what we're trying to do under the UNA, UNA project is to, to look at your river systems, look at that social reliance and try and find opportunities on rivers because unfortunately with this high reliance on your natural assets, providing, um, doing capacity building education enforcement in Africa in terms of a natural asset base isn't the way forward. You really have to provide an alternative, an alternative way that people, the social systems engage with their natural assets. Um, and so almost 70% of waste in, in river systems is organic, which provides an incredible opportunity for compost making and manure making. So we've been working with local communities in rural and urban areas um, to, to try and remove that waste and then generate a livelihood income using that compost, um, whether through art programs, through schools, schools are adopting river reaches. Um, so they're using those as like outdoor classrooms, their citizen science, or various ways of trying to use rivers um, connecting people um, and to generate this livelihood that that hopefully then adds to to the plethora of, of activities we have on rivers that um, really protect them. And mm -hmm. um, and we're seeing in these sections where we are starting to use this organic waste, removing it, making compost, um, that, that, that that link to waste generation and income that is really really beneficial for those local communities who are much much more willing to get involved because they see the the benefit in real day. Um, I think that's been the problem with the, this environmental social kind of justification is often the, the benefits are long-term and we need to suddenly get into a model where you can see the benefits of the environmental social balance um, in the present day. So, um, and that's what compost making has been doing. So, yeah. No, I mean, and I, what you're really touching on is also, you know, the, the secondary economies that come from that, that are kind of first economies like um, not only green economy, but like the water, energy, food nexus or, you know, food security, that can really come from that. I mean, just, you know, touching on this urban um, natural assets and looking at river systems within cities. Um, this is really it's such an exciting 
uh, uh, topic or area to be working in. And I think what's really interesting about that is that really these become the new, especially as we move towards a bioeconomy and moving towards this um, very circular systems, that these assets really become more valuable. And they're, they're also movement systems. So when you start thinking about, you know, like for instance, the traffic problems in Nairobi, or you know, how do we deploy um, our river systems to become really, you know, underpin those economic generators that, but also create more functional ecological infrastructure. I think on that note, perhaps, um, are there any, uh, Rocky, are there any questions from the floor that we could uh, ask? Maybe Dita, I could just quickly touch on that last point about the economic side of things, and this kind of links with the data conversation we we're having beforehand. Um, just on the river systems, um, Kampala, actually, we supported Kampala to do an economic kind of validation system, is if they removed one of their big river systems, wetland systems, um, how much money would they need to generate to provide to, to overcompensate or provide those services that that system was providing for free anyway. And it came to 1 billion US dollars per annum. And they eventually dropped the proposal because they, they wouldn't be able to generate that finances. So I think, I think like the world, the, the economic valuation and economic finances is a very important data discussion to have to try and try and validate economic services and environmental services through that so that money can actually protect them. And that will make uh, those I can't agree, can't agree with you more. You know, I think this is, this is a failure of the market system, is that we've never factored in the real value system for our natural assets. You know, and and now you know, we're getting to see pay the price for that. And the question, you know, maybe to the audience if we're still waiting for questions, but Sharif, you know, like, you know, you work for Siemens. <laughs> it's like Siemens are amazing, actually. I mean, it's one of those organizations which are doing like a lot of amazing things, especially with tech. Um, what's the relationship, you know, firstly within Siemens with a circular economy and how do you see you building kind of value, data value for natural assets? I mean, is that a topic that you're touching on, you know, like at Siemens? Uh, yes, um, I do believe that there is a lot go going on uh, going on over there. Um, uh, I guess as a disclaimer, Siemens is several thousand people, and uh, I don't. Uh, I'm not aware in details or a lot of aspects that are ongoing over there. But uh, to go back to your point, yes, I think. Um, uh, being able to engage at that level, I think it goes a little beyond the production to more the development of a solution, if you see what I mean. My point is, uh, I don't believe that it's a problem of uh, having a piece of software or hardware that can address the issue, but I do believe that the challenge is more, as you mentioned, how the marketplace is structured, who benefit from this data and who is willing to pay for it. And I do believe that the main push should be coming from government because it's uh, it's something that's been, it's benefit not only to an individual or, a, or an entity, but it's more a kind of public, uh, public information that can ben benefit ev everyone. I guess what I'm trying to say is that I do not believe that it's a, a, a technological issue that a single company could address. But uh, obviously, we are trying to work with all the stakeholders to see how we can contribute from our end as uh, a provider of technology so we can ease this integration or the creation of the, of the market uh, of a kind of, uh, or to in enhance the existing mar marketplace and see how we can make the data more available and more open. And over there, maybe I would just cite one uh, within the W3C. Siemens is quite active on the web of things, which is a way uh, to uh, enhance this open data exchange over internet. And I think that is one of the best things that a private company or a mainly uh, a company that is building te technology 
could provide for the community so they can take it from there and make use of it. Okay, great. I don't know um, whether I'm missing the feed here, but I'm still seeing whether any questions. Okay, here's a question. Um, yes, uh, sorry, I was uh, I was going to tell you, Dieter, but if you can if you can see them, there were a couple of them that somehow were already uh, answered about this um, the balance. Uh, between the uh, practice and the achievement of environmental goals. Um, so I think it has already somehow been answered. Okay, thanks, Dorothea. I see there's one from Adam. Uh, what yes. is the role of, is, mm -hmm. is that the one you're referring to? What is the role of policy and governance in managing, regulating, and enabling the different spheres of public, private, and civil society sectors in the second social compact? <laughs> wow, okay. Um, maybe. If anybody wants to answer that, feel free, particularly with respect to data and knowledge as a currency between these different domains and society. I mean, I think, I think what I'm going to do is just bring it back quickly. You know, when I initially wanted to start this conversation, um, Akshay, who excused himself today, he was part of the same um, Nairobi Park and friends of Nairobi Park and the you know, he's really been quite engaged with that. And Yana, I believe you were involved with uh, creating the green line along the edge of uh, the park. And then, of course, we have this other side of the park, which is the one that links to the hinterland. And this is private sort of freehold land where you're starting to see that system getting closed off. But maybe just to try and wrap the conversation up, because I think we've got three minutes um, Jess, do you see uh, Nairobi National Park as the key urban natural asset, or is there another key urban national asset for Nairobi? Um, it's a quick question. I think it's a key natural asset for sure. Um, I believe that there are only four classified urban parks in the world. Um, which is Nairobi is one of them. So just to have that status and the benefits and for like ecotourism and, and it's kind of like the lungs of the city. So it's massive, but I think it still comes down to ecological connectivity. So, um, you know, especially with that social thing, like rivers outside the boundary of the park are almost being interacted with, engaged with on a more daily basis. So that would mean mm. more to the local communities in mm. that country than the park would because the park is quite exclusive and, and quite mm. protected. Um, so I think they all play their role, but you have to kind of balance the ecosystem services that come with various things and then make sure that there's like this connectivity, ecological connectivity. Um, and who's benefiting from what and who has access to what? Sharif, um, you know, when they did this national gauge or the highway or roadways infrastructure through the national park, you could see the engineers tagging this on the edge of the park and you know why it's like i mean if i look at it from a planning perspective um obviously obviously park uh, conservationists hate the idea but cutting a massive highway system directly through the city comes at a cost and so the question is you know when we're thinking about um you know trade-offs I mean, I'm sure as a city, as a kind of person who's involved with data and looking at looking for particular efficiencies, how important is are like efficiencies? Because when you, for instance, decide, okay, well, we need to take that highway through the city, there's going to be a massive bill, like you pointed out earlier, can be billions of rands. It could take a lot longer. I mean, how how much do we need to consider? Um, trade-offs when we look at the impact of development on, for instance, uh, ecological infrastructure? Uh, I think it's a quite, uh, it's a quite excellent question. Uh, I do believe that uh, uh, a potentially good idea along those lines would be to associate uh, instrumentation with uh, those new projects, uh, mainly environmental uh, instruments in uh, the, uh, those kind of projects with some probes that can collect some information from surrounding. What I'm trying to say is that the, the stakes that are associated to those kind of projects mm -hmm. are definitely beyond my pay grade 
you know, those mm-hmm. are uh, national efforts that are quite important. Uh, however, something that can help to bridge um, between this trade-off, as you mentioned, is uh, to at least have it uh, used this uh, those kind of events in order to put measurement devices all along and put their data available for for the pub- public that can build this uh, the initial seed or the initial base of a public uh, repository for environmental data and that might uh, if it if it will not mitigate uh, the uh, any effect but it, it will help uh, the, the government understand what's happening and better react mm-hmm. to it. No, I mean, I think, I mean, we probably need to finish. I'm going to close with Jan, but just on your point, Sharif, just wrap up where we started. It's really about knowledge acquisition in order to make the right decision. So you could take a time, you know, before applying, you know, these decisions, but at least you can try and make the right choices. Yeah, and, uh, you know, not to throw a controversial statement in there about putting a highway through a park, but I mean, you know, perhaps you can just close on your work, you know, your initiative, just briefly in like two lines, just to close up the, the, the panel today. If you can just say what you did there, um, we'd be very interested to hear. I'm sure the public would like to know. Um, well, um... I'm happy to work uh, with uh, the company that is employing me now because they have a a real social vision. Um, And they have been founded by a Norwegian entrepreneur uh, who really uh, wanted to go into poverty alleviation. He didn't have to prove himself anymore for making money. He had done that before. Now he wanted to go really in poverty alleviation and he chose the dry countryside to do so. And uh, I think that was a great thing. And I've been working the majority of my life in uh, development aid. And then I stepped over to the private sector. But somehow I could continue to do all I was doing before. And uh, I must say that um, I'm happy for that. And then the second thing I want to say is that uh, landscape restoration, on one hand, you can say is a cheap thing if you can convince enough people to do it. But on the other hand, it's an expensive thing. Do not underestimate the cost of simple tree planting. It is not a simple thing. It is a tough business. And a lot of companies that I've seen are simply going under in their efforts to plant simply some trees. So uh, please, uh, this is my closing statement. More, Thank you so more much. value for restoration is needed. We need a market. We need a benchmark for market value for real restoration, like carbon tax, like something that needs to be easier. Okay, guys, that that was really amazing. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Love that. Uh, Hopefully we can continue the conversation soon. And Jan, keep up the good work. Sharif, amazing. And Jess, I'm sure we'll be in touch. eh? Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, everybody. That was a, a really fascinating presentation. And thank you so much to, to Dita for the, the excellent moderation. Um, there's so much to go from, and it's really interesting to see how the conversation is, is developing as, as we um, think about these different types of um, um, mechanisms we can use better. Traditionally, that there was a lot of separation between different actors in society. So thank you for highlighting all of that. Okay, good day everyone. I am Dr. Abdul Hamid Danju Mamambo, an associate professor and head of the Department of Civil Engineering uh, and Architecture of Nile University of Nigeria, Abuja. I'm very delighted uh, for the opportunity to moderate this Ignite session of the fourth International Conference on Innovation and Interdisciplinary Solution for Underserved Area, Intersol 2021. Uh, This session assesses nature-based solution for climate change mitigation and adaptation. As you're probably aware, nature-based solutions 
deploy ecosystem services to reduce or provide sinks for greenhouse gas emission, thereby leading to decreased vulnerability, as well as enhance resilience of communities uh, on climate change. And compared to technology-based solutions, these solutions um, provide longer time benefits and they are more cost effective. Uh, today, we have a lineup of reputable scholars who will be throwing light you know, um, on the prospects, challenges, success factors, good practice example from some communities in Africa. Uh, there's no time for elaborate introduction of uh, the speakers, but I'll quickly mention their name as well as uh, their uh, affiliations and the topic they will be discussing. Mr. Hamidi Seki of uh, University of York will be providing answers to how does ground uh, carbon stock um, spe and, and species composition changes with distance from large scale mine. Mrs. Amaya Wijenshinge of University of Cape Town, South Africa will be presenting informality ecosystem services and climate change, a look at Windhoek, Namibia. Mr. Anthony Kirani of University of Nairobi will be informing us on community-based conservation of key biodiversity and restoration of ecosystem affected by locust invasion in Northern Kenya. Dr. Jessica Ton of York University, UK, will be throwing light on her hypothesis that feature cities are already here if you know where to look with good examples uh, from Dar es Salaam, Tanzania and Windhoek in Namibia. Mr. Edmond Gitoro of Mishriki Research Consultancy in Nairobi, Kenya, will be assessing participatory mapping of livestock keeping system and migratory resilient pathway routes across Kilosa Mvomero district of Tanzania. Mrs. Immaculate Kimonto of University of Nairobi, Kenya, will be talking on Kenya regulatory framework on integration principle. Mr. Donald Limbe, a policy specialist with Southern Agricultural Corridor of Tanzania, will be telling us about climate change impacts on runoff regime in Kinyansunge Nkondoa catchment of Wami River based in Tanzania. And lastly, Dr. Hassan Omari, uh, if he's here, will be sharing his screen uh, with us. Uh, he's from University of Nairobi and will be uh, presenting uh, innovation in adapting water scarcity and abundance, Christian Muslim perspective. So the entire session will last for about an hour, starting with presentation that will be played back to back. Then it will be followed by brief answers to your question from the presenters. Uh, I must apologize in advance that uh, we will not have time to take all the questions that will come because of uh, our time. Uh, so uh, please, you can put your questions on the chats and indicate the speaker you are addressing to, and uh, we will be able to select which one we can within the time provided. I invite you all to enjoy the rest of the session. Thank you very much. When I think about African cities today, I think of mega cities like Lagos, secondary cities like Dakar, economic powerhouses like Johannesburg, or ancient cities like Timbuktu. But we have now reached a critical stage in human history. Africa is the world's second most populous continent, with the fastest growing cities expected to triple by 2050. And 59% of the population lives in peri urban or informal settlements often in hazardous zones due to their affordability and proximity to jobs and services. So what is the nature of these peri-urban settlements? Growth rates are unprecedentedly high. For example, in Namibia, at about 11% per annum compared to only 4% in formal areas. They depend on open defecation, regular electricity with informal tenure. Peri-urban areas are disproportionately at risk due to climate change. Two of the most deadliest hazards are flood risk and heat exposure, because homes are often constructed in riparian zones and indoor temperatures can be up to four to five degrees Celsius hotter than ambient temperatures. 
And with COVID, these vulnerabilities will be worsened with approximately 100 million people pushed into extreme poverty in sub-Saharan Africa. Thus, peri-urban areas are often larger and more populous than the formal city. But with one big difference, there is no central government. Local authorities are often unable to deal with the sheer magnitude and rate of these changes, while traditional methods of urban planning are incomplete, if not inadequate. You may think that this complex trend is a time way which cannot possibly be addressed, but I'm going to show you something different. Throughout my career, I've been fortunate enough to work with many great conservation biologists, urban planners, community organizers, and when traveling to over 60 countries, I've observed unbounded resilience found within these localities. I found that perhaps there's something that we can learn about adaptation. Until tools for urban planning and design are expanded, and new futures methods are made that account for uncertainty, predictions will be grossly inaccurate, and governance and financing will continue to be based on short-termism. Here's what some of the new approaches look like. We envision revisiting Wangari Matai's Green Belt vision of restoring functioning biodiverse green infrastructure across peri-urban catchments, bringing in a planetary health perspective. Green spaces are not only parks, but interlinked systems which support equity, activity and reduce climate hazards. To do this, we conduct analyses across catchments, from upland mountain systems to lowland peri-urban settlements, using participatory futures tools to understand human nature interactions. We harness big data and AI to build early warning systems. And through this work, surprising adaptations have already been shown. For example, in Havana in Vintuk, residents design open spaces to make informal settlements more like home. Green spaces provide sport and meeting areas, food or fodder, biodiversity, and help communities adapt to climate change by reducing heat stress, using shade, or sequestrating carbon. Similarly, along the Umsambazi River Valley in Dar es Salaam and in the Cape Flats, every year homes are flooded for three months. When walking through the streets, it's clear that life has been adapted to the specific way of living. Ecological infrastructure provides interconnected green spaces that are used differently across different seasons. And in the Fari Valley slums, which runs along the Nairobi River, we see a growing culture of innovation and revitalization. As residents shift from employing more generic coping strategies to flooding, such as evacuating homes, to restoring repairing buffer zones that filter water and reduce erosion. All of these examples demonstrate the kind of resourcefulness, ingenuity, that can provide solutions in the absence of more formal planning. From Dar es Salaam to Vintuk, these communities have approached the design of their neighborhoods responding directly to the environmental changes that regularly arise. These areas offer examples of the kind of socio-ecological stress anticipated in more established societies. They are a looking glass into the future. As I end, I'm trying to demonstrate that climate resilience, urban planning, conservation, and health cannot continue to be considered separately. This is a home. This is also a home. If you look closely, you'll find that all of these are homes as well. And this is also a home, a home where you find families who want to be a productive part of society and have fulfilling lives in the cities that they live in. And these are the types of homes that I'll be talking about in my presentation today. As we look at informality, ecosystem services and climate change, with a particular look at Vintuk in Namibia, um, this research is a part of the Urban Ecolution Research Program, which is housed African Climate and Development Initiative at the University of Cape Town, and it's also a collaboration with the University of York. So what do underserved areas look like in Namibia and in Vintuk? Well, they look sort of like this. Um, they're referred to as informal settlements, and the 2011 census tells us that 32% of urban homes in Namibia 
uh, with temporary structures such as these made from corrugated iron sheets. And they're found in peri-urban marginal areas um, in Vintuk, especially in the north and northwestern parts. And you get them on riverbeds, on hilly slopes, and in places like under electricity pylons, which are all hazardous areas. And these are the homes of economic migrants and maybe even climate migrants who have moved from the rural parts of Namibia post-apartheid to the city in hopes of better opportunities and livelihoods. And they could not afford housing in the former parts of the city, therefore they have built these shack homes in the peri-urban areas of cities. And because of this, they're exposed to a range of threats and hazards like um, heat exposure, droughts and water scarcity, problems with solid waste disposal, um, sanitation issues and open defecation lead to things like hepatitis E outbreak, food insecurities, livelihoods in the city not being accessible to them in the way that they expected um, due to reduced mobility. And also when there's heavy rains, there can be floods here as well. So there are a range of risks and threats already, and these are further compounded by the climate change impacts that are predicted for Bintuk and Namibia in the future. Um, the IPCC scenarios up to 2040, which is less than decades from now, um, shows that there could be two degrees warmer climate temperatures rather in Vintuk with twice as many hot days and one third less rainfall and that's just one scenario. So this is why there's a critical need for adaptation to climate change within the city and that's why the municipality authorities uh, known as the city of Windhoek are currently drafting their integrated climate change strategy and action plan and this includes provisions for adaptation in informal settlements as well. And this is where we're hoping our research can feed into and be mainstreamed into some of this planning being done by the city. And what we're really looking at is the role that urban green infrastructure can play to improve the resilience of um, informal uh, residents to this range of climate risks and hazards and other risks and hazards. And UGI is basically network of multifunctional, interconnected, um, predominantly permeable, so they are unbuilt space that supports um, ecological as well as social activities and processes within a city. And these need to be particularly planned into the um, functional fabric of a city. And in, especially in informal settlements, it becomes very important because these are basically green and blue spaces that can give um, urban ecosystem services and these are basically the uh, free benefits that nature can provide to people and this includes um, disaster prevention and mitigation by acting for instance as a barrier against flooding, uh, ameliorating the urban heat island effect, air purification, it can also filter things like grey water, food security is enhanced through things like urban agriculture in these spaces and also it's very important as a space for recreation and psychosocial well-being as well. So in Windhoek, these need to be holistically integrated into the city of Windhoek's adaptation plans and it's also very important to think about participatory mechanisms and how water can be managed better in order to ensure that the climate emergency is mitigated in the informal settlements in Windhoek and there's homes for everyone um, for everyone in the future. Thank you. Is it well with you all? It is well with me. My name is Anthony Karani from the University of Nairobi. In this work, I'm presenting on community-based conservation of key biodiversity and the restoration of 
ecosystems affected by locust migration in northern Kenya. Northern Kenya a beautiful scenery, a great landscape where wildlife and, and communities live together, and people have rich cultures and uh, indigenous knowledge. However, the whole of Africa biodiversity hotspot retains only about 5% of its original species. Locust invasion is definitely a problem. Locusts are heavy feeders. A small swarm can destroy a lot of vegetation. And experts actually believe that this is a problem that should have been prevented. Locusts arrived from Somalia and Ethiopia and spread across the northern and central counties. The affected counties doubled between February and April 2020 and affected about 3.1 million people. Data was retrieved from Global Biodiversity Information Facility. About 112 species were sampled and out of these 94 species had occurrence data, which included vulnerable, endangered, and critically endangered species. 40 of these species were affected, and 39% was in the path of locust invasion. Migrating swarms feed on, on crops, but they also feed on shrubs and trees, which include threatened species. And this is a problem for biodiversity. Again, control of locusts involves use of chemicals which may affect the soils, water, and non target species, the pollinator bees. We need a solution that is sustainable, that improves ecosystem resilience, and that promotes ecosystem health. More than 70% of wildlife roam freely outside protected areas. So we have solutions such as biodiversity assessment and planning. In this case, indigenous knowledge serves a key role. There is need for site-based actions which target particular local habitats to specifically identify and restore species at local scales and this may address issues such as planting trees in grasslands. Management of ridgelands is also another example of community-based approach. In this case, there is need for participatory planning and including benefit sharing with the local communities. We should also consider maybe destocking to reduce the population that is depending on these habitats and also employing the locals in the restoration programs in order to diversify our livestock economies. So in conclusion, we say that locust invasion is affecting sensitive habitats and some of these plant species have been affected entirely and this is a huge problem in ecosystem conservation. It is a food security issue. And so to recover the ecosystems in such a vast and biodiversity rich landscape, there is need for active, innovative solutions in northern Kenya. Thank you so much. Hi everyone, my name is Hamid Useki, a PhD student at the University of York, and I'm being supervised by Jessica Thorn, Rob Merchant, and Andrew Marshall. I'm here to give a, a brief talk about the indirect ecological impacts of commercial gold mining on adjacent ecosystems. 
briefly, uh, gold mining is an important driver of economic development, but it can also pose serious threats to biodiversity. Direct impacts are often at the minimum to, to its own footprint, but the indirect impacts are largely overlooked. Uh, indirect impacts of mining are more detrimental due to the cumulative impacts of nearby land uses and economic development. For example, uh, a good, uh, the collapse of Fundao tailings on 5th November is one, one of the good examples of indirect impacts of mining. On the same day of accident, the tailings reached the river Dosso in Brazil, and through that river, a 17th day later, tailings arrived at the Atlantic Ocean, which was 600 kilometers downstream. You can see the impacts. Uh, on that aspect were devastating. So here we are going to show that the, the, the indirect impacts of commercial gold mining can cause progressive leakages beyond the operation range boundary. So we collected data uh, from commercial gold mines of bearing edges uh, between 0 to 19 years, between March and July 2019. The boundaries of the commercial extraction areas were digitized from Google Earth. And then distant bands of 500 meters up to 5 kilometers radiating from the mining sites were generated. Four points of location were then determined using stratified random sampling across 500 meter distance band and habitat types. So we sampled the vegetation, beds, and, and butterfly in three different mining sites of varying ages. So this, the, the older site was uh, 19 years, and, and, and the intermediate site was 80 years, while the, new, the younger site has zero years in production. So we analyzed our vegetation data uh, for above ground carbon, stem density, and species richness, and species composition. Birds and butterfly data were also analyzed for richness and species composition. We used GLM, uh, a generalized linear model with cohesion error function to determine the influence of the different variables on same density. Above ground carbon and species richness for the uh, three taxonomic groups, uh, and the analysis were done separately for each site. So we used the redundance analysis to determine the influence of variation and species composition within each mining site. So our brief results revealed that in all the mines, uh, we found significant declines. Uh, uh, in above ground gammon, uh, in stem density, and both tree and butterfly species richness. So this, this figure shows the uh, declining trend of different uh, uh, stem density. But the yellow color represents the, the older side, at the, young, at the intermediate side, while the brown uh, color represents the, the, the older side. But also, uh, different groups of birds were analyzed also, and we found full growth bird species richness also declined outside mining lease boundary in. in, in all the mines, but the younger site showed no significant trends, as previous observed. But both fruit voles and grand voles beds were dependent on large trees. So we found this group of beds in places where there are, where are large stems of, uh, of trees. But also, uh, the ongoing degradation outside the mining areas, outside mining leases, uh, has caused changes in, in, in species composition uh, for the intermediate and, and, and the older site. So as we can see here, uh, the younger side showed no significant changes in species composition between living and, and also leaves because there was no much of a degradation, no development was happening. But at the intermediate side, there were, uh, we started to, to see the significant change in species composition, especially for the keystone and timber species. But uh, in, in the old side, the situation was worse. There were much completely alternation of species composition outside mining leaves where there was, uh, the, the key member species were maintained. Inside mining leases. So well, through that, we conclude that uh, uh, ecosystems surrounding commercial gold mines are highly impacted by activities indirect to the mining per se. Uh, the observed trends in ecosystems, a decline with distance from the mines, have resulted from the associated establishment and expansion of nearby settlements. Immigration has resulted from people seeking employment and other opportunities directly associated with the presence of gold, such as artisanal mining. So, from that, we recommend that prior to commencing mining, baseline should be conducted, extending beyond lease boundaries to predict the indirect ecological impact of mining activity. And an, an integrated land use plan approach will then be applied to improve sustainable development in mining regions to better support mining investment, or the best conservation, and ensuring sustainable flow of ecosystem services. Uh, that's all. Uh, thank you for your attention. Hello, my name is Immaculate and welcome to Integration. This is a principle which requires mainstreaming of environmental considerations into development agendas. 
International discourse on this principle dates back to 1987 and has since progressed as shown on this chart. Perhaps the most notable conference on integration was the 1992 Rio Conference on Environment and Development, where various instruments such as the Rio Declaration, Agenda 21, and the Convention on Biological Diversity were adopted. Kenya is a signatory to all these instruments. Nationally, Kenya has enacted laws and enacted policies which foster integration, such as Vision 2030 and the Constitution of 2010. The Constitution promotes integration through principles such as intergenerational equity, which is uh, found in the preamble of the Constitution, public participation, which is found in Article 10 of the Constitution, Sustainable utilization of natural resources, uh, which is found in Article 69 of the Constitution, which also uh, incorporates the principle of environmental assessments. Uh, further, Article 71 of the Constitution provides for parliamentary ratification of natural resource contracts, partly to ensure that environmental concerns have been addressed. Kenya's Vision 2030 and her commitments under the Sustainable Development Goals also incorporate integration of environmental consideration in development. Kenya's principal statute on environmental protection makes various provisions on the protection of the environment in development, and most dominantly being the mandatory requirement for environmental impact assessments on projects that are likely to cause environmental harm. These assessments are to be conducted uh, mandatorily before implementation of such projects. If the environmental impact assessments are satisfactory, the proponent will be issued with an environmental impact assessment license by the National Environmental Management Authority, as shown in this slide. Other natural resource statutes relevant to this presentation include the Mining Act, which requires environmental protection in all mining activities, most notably providing for environmental protection bonds to secure the mining holder mining rights holders commitment towards the protection of the environment the petroleum act of 2019 also requires environmental protection in oil and gas exploration and production in kenya The, the Energy Act of 2019 also makes provisions for protection of the environment uh, within the energy sector, uh, for example, by requiring environmental impact assessments in all energy projects. Lastly, uh, the Water Act makes provisions for the protection of water resources, especially in relation to water resources development by, uh, for instance, issuance of water permits and uh, making provisions for regulations such as prevention of trade, uh, effluent prevention of water pollution. So the moral of this integration narrative really is that given the global environmental challenges that uh, we are all facing as humankind, integration environmental considerations in development is crucial to our survival and to that of our children's children. Thank you very much for your time.
Donald, and today I'm going to present a topic on climate change impacts on rainfall regime and its impacts on our Kinyasungwa Mkondoa catchment area of Fuami River Basin in Tanzania. As you can see, uh, this is a brief introduction of the country, the population, demography, the area, and the GDP contribution from agriculture sector as well as other Letters. And actually, my simulation I used Mike 11, which is a professional engineering software that was developed by DHI, and it has these components. And today, I'm going to use the two components of, the, of uh, 11, which is rainfall runoff and hydrodynamic. The objective is to evaluate the applicability of this uh, Mike 11 NAM model in simulating the runoff rainf rainfall as well as to demand the runoff, water depth and level at different points, as well as to predict the, climate, the impact of climate change along the, the, the river one. As you can see, this is the study area. We have uh, nine water basin, and I choose uh, one, and this is the, the, the catchment that I, 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 I run my, my model. And this is the flow chart of my uh, methodology. I downloaded the SRTM, 30 meter resolution DM, and then I process it using ArcGIS and QGIS and input it in, in, in NAM model as well as hydrodynamics with other data. Also, uh, I run the statistical downscale of uh, climate change impact in A2 and B2 scenario. This is a carbon emission scenario. And this is a brief introduction of uh, how the statistical downscale is done. It starts with a uh, future greenhouse emission, and then it changes in, in global as well as regional, and then you downscale it in a, in a catchment or a basin level. The data used, as I said earlier, is RRT, SRTM DEM from uh, NASA, as well as uh, hydrometeorological data, which is from Minnesota Water and Irrigation, as well as Tanzania Meteorological Association, as well as rainfall from seven different uh, stations, discharge, as well as uh, other data. I also use NIC RM with CBS to evaluate the model efficiency. And this is how it is determined and uh, the range of acceptance, whether it's good, satisfactory, or unsatisfactory. Other tests I used uh, is turning point and other tests. Actually, uh, my catchment, I use this to distribute the rainfall. And this is how it is distributed, distributed based on area and the area and the percentage of the thickened organ on each of the the rainfall uh, range data. Uh, under the model calibration and validation, this was the, the initial NAM parameters that I used to calibrate. And actually, these are the ones that I used for validation as well. This is an interface of how, how hydrodynamic was made. It starts with the uh, processing of uh, EEM, generating the cross section and also the other, the boundary condition the HD parameters that are that, that are I set and also uh, other parameters. And also I run the the sensitivity sensitivity analysis of different parameters and this is how it was responding changing from uh seven percent twenty five percent and five percent up and down and respond to different uh, parameters. These are the results from uh, the calibration from 2006 to 2009, as well as validation from uh, 2011 to 2013. And you can see there is a validation accumulated in that. And these are the, the results of RMC, NAC, and the PPI bias, as well as other calibration results and validation results, which is R square, water balance level, and uh, Simulation and also these are the results for hydrodynamics. With the one on at the left, it shows water level, and one at the right, it shows water depth. At different points, you can just see because it has a water level, and the, the, each color represents the, the depth. And as for statistical downscale and uh, climate predict, I used a statistical result from A2 and B2. You can see the rainfall temperature and the percentage increase. And you can see the, the 
also ah, okay the discussion i said uh, this met i had with them it was run it was run on the same basis the water level and discharge was determined and also rainfall temperature was showing an increase of 10 percent and 2.5 percent for a2 as well as 33 percent and 2.4 percent for b2 by 2048 at five percent significant level and also discharge result for a2 scenario shows the decreased trends in the months of august as well as february and june and september the limitation was uh the values of, of et was calculated by using pen pen penman motive mode which was input into the model so that being it thank you for listening Hello everyone, my name is Edmond Gedoro, an independent researcher working for Mushiriki Research Consultants. I'm going to take you through my presentation titled Participatory Mapping of Livestock Keeping Systems and uh, Migratory Resilience Pathway Routes Across Kilosa and Vomero Districts in Tanzania. Basically, Kilosa area in Tanzania is an agricultural area where most people are composed of crop farmers and livestock keepers who are mainly pastoralists. To get a clear picture of their day-to-day -day livelihood, we had to involve them in an exercise or activity called PGIS. What is PGIS? PGIS is Participatory Geographical Information Systems, an approach where we sat down with them, the locals, with a group of experts trying to understand them, them better, uh, basing them on using their, the base map of their area. The map here shows tracks and trails of uh, livestock keepers or pastoralists which they use to and from grazing lots or in search of pasture and uh, water throughout the year. Uh, and uh, they seem to encounter various challenges like uh, meet, getting protected areas, uh, uh, conflict of resources which seem to be a common occurrence between crop farmers and livestock farmers, uh, getting broke cage of uh, migratory routes and uh, drought among others. My presentation today shows the drivers of climate change, the pathways, and the livestock migratory routes, which seems to be a near to year day of life. And through this, with all life, these migratory tracks or routes could be tracked better and up with them. Future livestock tracks, or even build more on our research finding on this. By that, I mean, if you look at the picture on the left hand side, you see the locals or the participants had on a base map and they are trying to identify diff, the, their area with things like landmarks in the Kilosa Vomero area. And through that, they were able to have a more clear picture and understanding and it brought them to better understand their locality. Bringing them to this level was in a way able to make them identify common dynamics and uh, opportunities and they were able to think beyond the box or outside the box hence able to tell like this is where this is where i live this is where we get the we have the watering point this is where we mm, graze our animals when the rest of the places is dry if you can have a look at the center, we have a legit here, which has uh, more resources on the ground. And uh, believe me, it's them who identified these resources. And surprisingly, they were able to identify them one by one in an easy way. This 
whole exercise in a way seems to trigger them identify more opportunities, gaps, and even project their livelihoods in a way. Uh, let me say it was a real participatory as it had a lot of uh, humor, a lot of energy in them, and a lot of ownership when they were trying to come up with uh, this uh, map. In this participatory approach, we had a more uh, uh, we had more insights and uh, some of the pasture migratory paths and routes came out very well. And it's in this exercise that we are able to come uh, to come up with uh, better terminology known as harvesting of mature livestock. The pastoralists felt when the experts, the agriculture experts, the climate change experts told them like, you guys, you have to destock your animals. They felt it was a bit insultive rather than where farmers, crop farmers do very well and they are told, yes, you've had more yield, keep it up and grow more yields for the people. And they felt like uh, harvesting their animal, which was kind of a hard way of getting them to this talk, would in turn uh, do them a good thing as they to reduce that degradation Pastures, pasture scarcity, and also uh, loss of livestock during the occurrence drought throughout the season due to climate change. Therefore, PGIS as a tool was able to bring out the real life scenario and possible projection scenarios uh, us with more questions than answers on future mitigation and intervention. As I close, I would like to thank you all for your time and active listening, I'm Harbord. In case of more questions, comments, as well as ideas, kindly don't hesitate getting back to me and I'll address them accordingly. Have a good time, stay safe, take care. Below here are my contacts. Thank you, bye. Okay, um, that is fantastic presentation from uh, our scholars. As you can see, um, the issues raised cover diverse area from uh, uh, city planning to agriculture to mining. And uh, they indeed touch some critical areas that affect um, uh, Africa's uh, development. Uh, uh, the question I would like to ask, um, uh, probably I'll just start with the last uh, speaker uh, who is talking about uh, mapping, uh, uh, I mean, cattle routes um, and others. Is that, do you think that this, your mapping can solve the problem of farmer headers uh, crisis that is happening in, in, in many sub-Saharan Africa? Does it have the potential to address that? Quickly, in one minute, please. Sorry, I said my question is uh, addressed to um, Mr. Edmond Gitoro. Um, there's quite a number of head, uh, farmer head, headers crisis happening in many sub-Saharan Africa. And, 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 and a lot of it, the underlying factor is competing for, um, uh, um, I mean, uh, resources in terms of uh, the, the feed for animal and, and water, uh, as well as um, uh, uh, damages that are caused to farmland. Do you think that this year mapping has the capacity to uh, address this problem? Thank you very much for that question. I believe that question, uh, depending with the, the approach of PGIS, where different stakeholders came together, in a way, is a good way of solving those problems. Because if we can uh, incorporate all the stakeholders, all the issues will come out, all the gaps, all the differences will come up. And uh, from there, we'll be able to come up with a better solution because either participatory, participating from all corners, from all levels. And with that one, we can harmonize and come up with a very nice intro, like uh, the way you just collect data from different areas. This one will be more reliable, more viable, and uh, more 
uh, resort oriented. Thank you. Okay, our time is already fast spent, but I have a co-moderator here who is uh, in the person of uh, uh, Data uh, Brand. So I will ask him to just give us the concluding remark for this session. Thank you. Um, well, I see there's so many great panelists here. Um, perhaps just a couple of comments, like the, the gold mine uh, paper with the impact of the unforeseen impact of growth is really, um, I think, a very critical point that mines should really look at um, and should be included in the um, licensing that mines get. So I, I, I really do think that we have many valuable lessons that can be taken out of this. And if you go back to, for instance, um, Jessica and Amaya's first comments about um, the future cities already here, this type of informality and you know, how do we plan for informality? How do we begin to put instruments in the smallest instruments in place in order to manage that growth? And I think, you know, the, the very valuable lessons to be taken out of here. Perhaps Amaya and Jessica, you want to just comment on how you see um, what, what, what are the sort of most efficient instruments that could be put in place to be most effective with uh, dealing with informal growth? Well, I'll do some quick comments and let Jessica add on to this. But I think it's proactive, a, pro a proactive approach to this type of rural urban migration that's happening in African cities at the moment. Um, it's only projected to, you know, increase really exponentially up to 2050 and beyond. And local authorities, in many ways, they, they hope that, for instance, there are other strategies like let's create rural hubs and, and improve those so that people don't migrate to the city. Um, but I think the reality is that you will have increased migration happening into cities over the next um, decades. And then it's about proactively, you know, planning ahead beyond just even five year plans to think about how these cities can be transformed and these new citizens within these areas included in the planning and the, and the living uh, spaces being planned with them in these cities. And that's the role that, you know, things like blue and green spaces beyond just providing things like a space for urban agriculture and for food security also helps with their feelings of belonging within these cities and, and how much they're willing to invest and and um, make their spaces and make their homes within cities. Mm. Um, and that's great. Mm. It's so like informal space is a, a, a resource. I, mean, I think Jessica, you touched on that. I'm aware that um, Seki and Maculata here, so maybe I'll give the time for them to speak instead. Seki, um, Maybe you can just comment on that. Do you, do you see um, sort of uh, what, are, what are the sort of res resources that you see with in kind of more organic or informal growth? Do you see there are any sort of that resources available for that? Do you see it as a potentialities that you can use? Maybe just remind me, I think we're running, running out of time. Uh, Seki, your paper was? Direct impacts on, of mining. So perhaps you talk some. Are you you the mining uh, paper? Around, Great. Around yeah, yeah. yeah. Um. What what I can say in terms of mining, uh, like any other developed, uh, big development project, uh, when people see uh, there is a certain development project somewhere, they see opportunity. They see business opportunity. They see uh, income. So. Uh, when talking about mining specifically, there are different ways that people explore resources. Uh, exploration uh, varies with technology. So big uh, mining uh, uh, have advanced technology uh, as compared to small scale or, or artisanal mining. So when, for example, artisanal mining sees a certain uh, mining company is establishing somewhere, what they see is uh, very easy resources 
there that we pulled in the tech before. So they started to come in, in, in places where this large scale mining they are establishing themselves. And the difference is large scale mining always are, are, com are compliant, to a, compliant to a certain uh, regulation. But this small and artisanal mining do not adhere to them because there is less monitoring to the small scale mining these are the large scale mining. But when a certain mining is establishing itself, people are coming in. It's like when people are moving from uh, rural areas to, to cities like Amaya and, and just are present, uh, presented. But also when they see large scale mining, people uh, started to see there is uh, opportunities there. People coming, uh, coming to see. So increase in population to those areas adjusted to mining areas, they are degrading ecosystems that were not in plan for that large scale mining. So when, whenever they, they, they are given the mining lease, for example, they are uh, compliant to the area that they are just uh, licensed with. But they are forgetting that people will come in and they will destroy uh, other ecosystems outside their mining lease. So mm -hmm. from that, what we need to plan is to think beyond. Uh, and when we think about management in mining areas, we need to, seek, uh, to think about landscape level and not just confined in, in, in mining areas. Absolutely. Um, I couldn't agree with you more. Who, who did the paper with the uh, locusts? Anthony. It's Anthony Kirani, yes. Hi, Anthony. Great. Uh, very interesting. I mean, did you look at the relationship with your, you know, with your studies across the Sahel region? You know, did was that part of your uh, thinking? My presentation was on uh, a locust invasion in northern Kenya. Yeah, and, so I, I mean, do, do you review that in, in the larger systems? I mean, typically, you know, we're getting these cyclones that are driving all the way from um, the, the east coast and then warming up the seas and then you're getting the movement of locusts and they move right across um, you know, you know uh, that Sahel region. So I was just I wanted to know if you if you kind of interconnected this with you know um, the, the movement system that typically happens with locusts. So my, my review was uh, actually on northern Kenya. The the the, the uh, biodiversity data I collected focused on just a small section within the northern part of Kenya that was affected by locust invasion. Okay, um, Mama, would you like to ask another question? Well, I, I think the time for, for, for the session, we're already eating into the, the break um, uh, time, uh, but if I'm to ask the last question, uh, it will be to Hamidu Seki. Um, you, you, you look at, um, uh, how species composition varied with uh, distance to, 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 to mine. Did you also look at the social um, the implication on, on human being? Uh, I remember the, the, there were issues of uh, lead poisoning, as well as uh, insurgency around some mines uh, in, in Zamfara State in uh, not um, Western Nigeria. So uh, it's, it's like wherever there is mine, these issues are also played out. So do you think that your, your, your consideration of uh, uh, this um, uh, species composition around mine also touches on that? Uh, thank, thank you for the question. Uh, what I just presented in, the, in, uh, in my presentation today was just uh, looking at the ecological uh, component of impact for mining. But uh, this is just part of... Uh, a small part of my PhD, which also comprising of the social uh, social aspect in, in the other other chapters. Yeah, when you when you uh, talk about mining, uh, the impact goes beyond environmental, goes beyond environment. So it also touches social life. People will get employed, but in turn also people will get affected. Look at the different impact of mining. For example, uh, sink vis-a-vis -vis source impact. When we talk about sink impact, well, we are, we are looking 
on those impacts that generate materials to the environment. So when you refer, for example, to the gold mining, they're using cyanide or mercury, for example, which is the case of particular mining. And those are being uh, directed to, to, towards the river system, river that uh, people depend on uh, clean water and, and, and so much more. They get uh, fish and, 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 and so much. A lot of ecosystem services are being impacted by mining. So mining is not just confined in biodiversity. It's just that uh, I think impacts are so much researched in, in, in a scientific environment. Uh, people are leaving out uh, source impacts, like how much uh, mining is taking from the environment and not how much mining is giving out to the environment. So I was focusing a bit of how much uh, mining is taking from the environment and just give a, a brief overview on what I found uh, in uh, using Tanzania as a, as a case study. Yes, great points there. Thank you very much for um, this um, fantastic um, presentations. Uh, and uh, we come to the end of this session. Uh, once again, thank you for giving me the opportunity uh, to moderate this section. Thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Deda Brandt for supporting me um, and have a nice day. So it is actually my pleasure to introduce uh, this uh, session on human food, energy, and cons construction impact and monitoring. So the uh, message that I got by going through this is that Mother Nature has given us a lot. And some of the talks today will be showing us uh, some good stuff that Mother Nature has given us. But we will need to take care of those. We will need to take good care of those uh, when we use them. Uh, some of the talks also will tell us uh, about that. So it is my pleasure today to introduce David Amadou. So David from Ems, Bene. Amadou from University al Job of Bambay, Mambo uh, from Nile University, and Arno from Abume Kabali University in Benin. So without uh, uh, going too much into the detail, let's uh, give the floor to our presenters, and at the end we'll invite them to join us in the discussion. Jessica, to you for the keyboards. Hi, my name is David Agungoma. In this in this presentation. I'm going to talk about two main issues faced by the mangrove forest in the municipality of Wida, named demographic pressure and soil production activities. The presentation will follow this outline. We we'll start with the introduction, and the background, the study area, the problematic, the two main uh, threats on the mangrove forest, some alternative, the challenge faced by this alternative some recommendation and we will end with the conclusion. As a developing country in West Africa, Benin Republic is convinced that tourism is one of the main assets on which to build uh, the country's economy. This is well stated in the action plan of the government since 2016. It is therefore important to identify, develop and enhance site and location with the tourism uh, potential such as uh, WIDA could play a key role during the transatlantic trade slave 
between the 14th and the 18th centuries. This UNESCO site of the door of no return is the perfect example of this ambition with this recent years some emphasis on ecotourism. However, the rapid growth of the population coupled with urbanization have been a main concern for these uh, natural resources and cultural site in the municipality of Wida. And that is why in this presentation, we will investigate the impact of demographic pressure and stock production activities on the main asset of ecotourism in Wida, named uh, the mangrove forest. Wida is one of the eight uh, municipalities of uh, the Atlantic region, and it is about 40 kilometers far from Cotonou, the main city. With its uh, south equatorial climate, Wida is characterized by two rainy seasons alternated with the two dry seasons of unequal duration. The average temperature and the annual precipitation are respectively 37 degrees Celsius and 1,000 millimeters of rain per year. The land cover types include grassy savanna, swamp, and mangrove forests, mostly located in the coastal district of Wapenaho, Jebaji, and uh, Avlekete, our targeted communities. Because of uh, the presence of the Lagoon of Wida and the Atlantic Ocean, the population of these communities practice fishing, horticulture, salt production. However, salt production remains the main activity of this population. So with the rapid growth of the population, there have been an increasing demand for firewood, and this situation has led to a progressive uh, destruction of uh, the mangrove forests and causing a substantial challenge for protection and preservation of this uh, uh, ecosystem and all the species that rely on it. <clears throat> that is why <clears throat> the problematic is what action can help protect the ecosystem of the mangrove while enabling uh, the salt production activity with alternatives. In other words, how can we save both the mangrove uh, forest ecosystem as well as the economic activities of these uh, communities? First, let's look at uh, some benefits that people gain from mangrove forests uh, in the world. The term mangrove actually refers to a, a wetland ecosystem of plants that have evolved and adapt to survive in the interface between land and ocean uh, in the humid tropical regions. In sub-Saharan Africa, mangroves have fulfilled uh, multiple uh, functions such as uh, wood and non-wood forest products. They also play a coastal protection role by protecting uh, uh, from climate change, wind, and also coastal erosion. Mangrove also uh, play the role of uh, a conservative role for, bio, uh, for biological diversity by providing habitat and breeding nursery environment for uh, fishes and many aquatic uh, species, as well as migrant birds. In the recent years, mangrove have also been shown to provide uh, economic development being a, an ecotourism asset. So let's look at uh, the state of mangrove in the municipality of Wida. With the increasing of the population from 1992 to 2016, here on this bar chart, the population has passed from uh, about seven, 70,000 to almost 200,000 inhabitants over the last two decades, showing an, an, a, an increased rate of more than 200 
and all this without any adequate planning from the municipality. And this has led the population without any access to gas or uh, an alternative to uh, exploit the mangrove forest as source of uh, firewood for their economic activity and the household. Now let's look at salt production. The presence of uh, the Lagoon of Wida has been a great asset for these communities because it offers them the possibility to uh, produce salt. So with the withdrawal of uh, the, the, the lagoon during the dry season, the production chain begins with the collection of salted storm sun cruise, which is then mixed with uh, water from the lagoon and filtered through a filter built uh, locally. And you can see the filter on the right, which is also equipped with uh, the pipe at the bottom to collect the brine, uh, highly uh, concentrated salty water. The production of salt is based on a chemical process named uh, called crystallization. These women use uh, 27 liters of brine with uh, uh, 53 kilograms of wood to produce 3.5 kilograms of raw salt within two hours. And on the right, you can also see uh, the traditional stove that they use, which has a shape of an empty uh, cylinder with uh, an opening at the bottom for the wood and tree at the top for the poles. But with uh, the combined actions of um, uh, the demographic pressure and soap, uh, soap production, there have been uh, a lot of uh, issue with the mangrove, the sustainability of the mangrove forest it has led for many action. And the first have been uh, the restoration plan in 1998, uh, initiated by the government to uh, rebuild or reforest uh, the communities. Also, the issuance of a decree to prohibit the, the exploitation of any kind of uh, coastal uh, resources, including the mangrove forest. There is also the proposition of a solar salt production and some alternative solution to the traditional stove. And on the right, you can see the Nivo stove. The main issues with uh, this solution are uh, uh, multiple. The, soil, the solar soil production is not welcome because it's uh, seen from the communities not to, be, uh, not to provide a healthy salt at the end. And many of these alternative solutions do not guarantee uh, the time, uh, time uh, benefit or uh, also consume a lot of uh, wood. And that's why we recommend that we recommend that uh, at the country level to reinforce the laws and also uh, make it uh, known to the general public through sensitization. At the municipality level, we call for a more collaboration with this population in order to get the feedback on the alternative solution and improve them. We also uh, call for the development of a plantation in order to sustain them uh, in terms of firewood in the meantime. So in the conclusion, we see that mangrove represent uh, a valuable asset for not only Benin, but also the municipality of Wida. But the population, the growth of the population and salt activity, activity been, have been a, a major threat for its sustainability. Laws and decrees have been taken, but also uh, more action needs to be uh, done in order to improve the alternative solution. Thank you for your attention. Senegal. It is a great honor for me to participate on the 8th International Conference on Innovation and Enterprise Solutions. 
for endless reference and the standard service area. We shall review my paper entitled Supervisor Strategy of Ability System, which is prepared for organizations to use the electric work. This is part of our case work. I work with Professor Sengan Bhut and Dr. Dr. Alpha Selim Jai. The outline of our presentation is summarized by the following one. In the first time, we will do as a introduction. We, we, we do the presentation of the system. We do the modernization of the component of the system. To do the command approach of our system. Present the simulation result and discussion. And end this uh, presentation by conclusion and outlook. Uh, the development. Sound off. To contribute to the development of energy mix. And access to energy is the first step to associate economic development. Renewable energy, in particular the photovoltaic system, uh, seems to be the solution to this problem uh, because it ha 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 has a good potential in our area and, have a, and can be decentralized in the rural areas. Uh, the main problematics of the photovoltaic system are the intermittent source of the, his intermittent of the source, the low energy conversion of the photovoltaic systems, the phenomenon of overcharge and deep of discharge of the batteries, the benefits of having battery in photovoltaic photo photo system is a self-consumption of EV systems. Batteries is the most fragile element in photovoltaic system. And its lifetime is closely dependent to how it is charged or discharged. To to the importance to develop a supervision control of the batteries is there for no longer to be discussed. It must be carried to make the requirement cost, simplicity, generality, generality and reasonable technology of the, of, of the battery can be only so regulation and control of the state of charge in order to improve the lifetime of the batteries. Passing to this problematics, our objective is to optimize the efficient conversion of photovoltaic system to supervise the charge of discharge of the batteries. And our system is present in the in, in this slide and in, in the day of this presentation we just limit it in uh, the, the, the our, um, our PD system fit a DC load and a static converter are used to uh, between the, the, PV, the PV source, the battery, and the load. And we will do the, the modernization of the, uh, of the component of uh, this system. In the first time, the, book, the boost converter is sold in this figure and Operating in, uh, in, 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 in two seconds. In the first time, when the switch is on, and in the second seconds is when, when the switch is off. All the seconds are, are summarized in this, in, in, in this equation, and thus this equation gives a mathematical model of the boost converter. And the other converter that we use is the boost converter. The particularity of this uh, converter. It can operate in mode book or in mode bus. And the mathematical model of this converter is, give, is given by the equation number three. And in the last time, the modernization, we will do the modernization of the batteries. And it is uh, the mathematical model of the batteries can be summarized by this following equation. It's the first one is the state of charge, the voltage charge of the batteries, the voltage discharge of the batteries. After the modernization of uh, the component of the system, we will do the command approach of this, uh, of this, of this system. In the first time, we, 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 de we develop an artificial network maximum power point tracking 
to optimize the power of the PV system. Uh, the PV system gives its maximum power for a particular valor uh, or a particular point, namely maximum power point, point, maximum power. And the classical method, methods such as uh, incremental quantities or theoretical offset cannot found efficient, found efficiency this point. That's why we use an intelligent integrated control, uh, basis of artificial, uh, artificial intelligence, to track efficiently this point. And to design uh, artificial neural network, we are following, we, are, so we, are, we use this following uh, step. In the first time, so then we choose a number of neurons number of neural in, in each bio, the activity function of the bio, the train algorithm, because it determines the final value of the ray and the bias. All these steps are summarized in the flowing uh, in the flowing flow chart. And uh, we just uh, in the first time give two hours to our model uh, 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 the data the database. It is composed of the P uh, of the, the column and the voltage and of uh, the system and train for many approach in order to have a good performance of our artificial learning network. After, after designing the, our artificial learning into control, we will do the regulation of the DC link voltage. The DC link voltage depends on the power on the PV power, the battery current charge and discharge, and load power. To maintain it at a constant power, two control loop current and voltage are used, and to maintain constant the voltage, we use two classical uh, corrector, uh, or PI corrector and PID corrector, and the mathematical model of this uh, regulation system is given by the following equation. After the regulation of the DCB voltage, we will uh, do, we will represent the our strategy of uh, strategy of physical reason. We wish to protect the batteries against the dip of charge and dip of discharge. For each variation of, uh, of the PV, the actual network or network integrated MPPT controller gives the optimal power of the, of, of the panel and it is compared to the power of the load. And this, uh, this, 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 this supervision strategy takes the state of charge of the batteries and active one of the, of one of the four modes. The four modes and each mode are discrete. By, by, by a comparison of the PV, PV, of, the, PV of, the, of the panel, PV of the load, and the state of charge of the batteries. And all this, uh, all this, all, all this command are implemented on the MATLAB, uh, on the MATLAB and we use uh, this, some, this, this surveillance condition, like the, the irradiation in temperature, to solve the performance of our uh, command that we developed. In the first time, we see that uh, for each variation of the uh, climatic conditions, the DC voltage is kept constant, which the classical PI and PID corrector. And on, uh, a comparison study of, two, of these two corrector is done, and we show that the PID corrector gives better performance in terms of response time and position. Uh, in, this, in, in, in this slide, we present the power of the and the power of the uh, of the PV. And here we see the state of charge of the batteries. Uh, for each variation of the power, uh, the battery is in mode charge and or in mode discharge. And when, when the power of the PV is less than the power of the load, the battery is in mode discharge to to power it the uh, the, the power load and the PV power it again the load. And in in, in, figure, in, figure, in figure two, in figure eleven, we see the Swiss correlation. In this, in, 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 in this test, we, saw, we see that the, the panel is corrected, the battery is corrected, and the load is corrected. In order to, to check if our television strategy is efficient, we do some tests. In the first one, we choose a step of charge to less than the, 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 the minimum step of charge in order to see if of becomes the batteries and we see S3 is in more it is equal to zero that uh, why that was the battery is decorated. And the other test is we choose a step of charge with greater than the maximum step of charge and we see that 
the path is is degenerated because the power of path is equal to zero. That's something that here you can conclude that our study of supervision uh, can protect the path is against against the discharge and uh, overcharge. And that's why we can conclude that the study of supervision improves the lifetime of the path is. In conclusion, an optimization of PV system is done by artificial network. Regulation of the DC wind over time is, to, is done to maintain constant the uh, to, uh, to a constant power by using two classical protocols PI and PID. And we can complete that the PID protocol get performance from the user PI protocol. A protection of the battery is done by the supervision strategy because for each variation of uh, instead of charge, the strategy of supervision connect or to connect the batteries in order to protect the tip uh, to the uh, tip of charge and uh, over charge. And in our group, we have constant to validate our control strategy by doing a real life implementation which holds all the factors that can impact the performance of the system. Thank you very much. Thank you. Abdul Hamid Mambo. Uh, I'm an associate professor of civil engineering, the head of the Department of Civil Engineering and Architecture in Nile University of Nigeria, Abuja. I am presenting this paper, Physiochemical, Mineralogical, and Physical Properties of Overboarding Urban Nase Basement Complex in Mina Metropolis, Nigeria. On behalf of the author, Dr. Mustafa Mohammed Al Haji, and other authors like Musa Al Hassan, uh, Tayyip Wahid Ajumo, and Abdullahi M. Yahya. Tropical soils represent the most heavily weathered soils on Earth. This is because Tropical climate is characterized by high temperatures and rainfall patterns, promoting extreme alteration of mineral from the parent rock, resulting in the formation of new minerals. Soil mineralogy plays an important role in the forming of the character of the soil, such that the key feature employed to differentiate soil at the highest level depend on its mineralogy. These properties are responsible for all the physical properties of the whole body soil and consequently the engineering properties of such soil. Geologists over the years have proved that basement complexes differ from one position to the other over the entire earth crust depending on the rock underlying the complexes. The most common basement complexes identified are the granitic gneiss and cis basement complexes. Granitic basement is the most widely existing basement complexes in the world and have received wide studies. However, little studies have been carried out specifically on cis and magmatite gneiss basement complexes. Soil engineers often burrow holes in overboarding soil on these complexes for construction of structures or to lay a heavy structures on the overboarding over these complexes without considering possible differences in the physical properties and consequently the engineering properties of these soils. Ignoring the variability and mineralogical and physical uh, and physiochemical uh, characteristics on this residual weathering profile with them is denying the different formation factors of this soil and may lead to misleading results and consequently serious failures to engineering structures erected on them. This work is therefore aimed at studying the variation with depth in the physiochemical, mineralogical, and physical properties of the overboarding on magmatite, 
NACE complex in MENA metropolis, not central Nigeria. Um, this study area can be seen in the dotted red, um, and the brown map is a map of Niger State, one of the 36 states in Nigeria, the largest in terms of land, land mass. And of course, that is the map of Nigeria. And this is an extended uh, portion of the map of the study area. The methodology, uh, the materials used in the studies uh, involve the topsoil samples collected in one trial piece. So one trial piece was actually the trial pit was manually dug to a depth of four meters. But from four meters, it became almost impossible to dig manually. You need specialized equipment to continue beyond a depth of four meters. So the disturbed soil samples were collected at a depth of 0 0.5, 1, 1.5, 2, 2.5, 3, 3.5, and 4 meters. That makes about eight samples collected for this particular experimentation. The specimens were then taken, uh, prepared, and then taken um, uh, or sent to Ihemba Laboratories, Somerset West in South Africa for X-ray diffraction types, the XRT. The physiochemical tests um, covering the cation exchange capacity, cation carbonate, organic matter, loss on ignition and pH values were carried out using the method highlighted in the British Standard 1377. Other physical properties tested at the specific gravity and the compassion characteristics. The results of mineralogical characteristics of soil um, obtained from the X-ray diffraction uh, test. The mineralogical analysis results from the weathering profile on the nest basement complex as shown in figure one and table one. Each of these um, uh, charts are actually represent each of the sample that was tested, so there are about eight of them. And as it can be observed um, from the various minerals that were found at each depth, um, Fesfar, as well as uh, Amphibol, uh, are commonly found throughout the depth of the soil. Uh, however, carbonates are more predominant in the top uh, soil up to a depth of about uh, three meters from where the carbonates were now replaced with carbon. So the physiochemical properties determined for well, are the cation exchange capacity, organic matter content, pH uh, value, as well as loss on ignition. The variation with that of weathering profile is presented in figure two. As you can see clearly here, the um, organic matter content reduces up to the depth of three meters and then increases significantly from the three meters. So what is expected, of course, is for the organic content to reduce. But the increase after three meters was due to increase in carbon content, uh, carbon uh, from the depth of three. So this actually behaves uh, according to what is expected, because the soil that are closer to the top will contain more organic matters than soil found in at, at greater depth. Also here, we can see the loss of ignition reduces. This shows because the organic content is reducing, it shows that when a dry sample of the soil is ignited, the loss of weight uh, uh, generally reduces. And this is also what is expected at that level. We also see that the cation exchange capacity uh, initially decreases and then increases. And the pH value uh, generally um, 
um, increases and then stabilizes. The liquid limit plus the index and natural moisture contents. Uh, liquid limit increases and then reduces. Plus the index increases and then reduces. The natural moisture content also increases, reduces, and then increases. This is the result of the sieve analysis conducted on the sample of soils uh, according to the depth. And dry density generally increases with depth. Specific gra gravity initially reduces and then increases. Moisture content, okay, uh, reduces with depth. So the conclusion, the mineralogical characteristic of a boarding soil and nice basement complex with depth consists basically of amphibolites and feldspar within the entire profile with little alteration of carbon element contained at lower stratum of the profile to grigorites at the upper stratum. The natural moisture content well as the atomic limit increases between 1 to 1.5 meter depth, after which the value is reduced to a constant value at a depth of 3. The results of the grain analysis coupled with the atomic limit classify most of the soil within the profile as salty sort of sand, SM, based on the unified soil class test. The general grade size distribution curve is capped on the top soil at one meter depth and covered at the base by soil from three meter depth. Beyond three meter depth, the gradient began to decrease again. From all these results, it is clear that the variation in both physiochemical and mineralogical as well as physical contents of soil with depth um, can be significant. And this can actually affect the stability of structures that are mounted of them. This particular paper has pointed out the importance of conducting mineralogical um, um, tests on soil sample before massive construction work can be undertaken. Thank you very much for listening, and I wish you the best of luck in the rest of the presentation. Hello, everybody. My name is Obus Kiki. I'm a PhD student in electrical engineering science in Doctorate School of Engineering Science in Abu Makalavi University in the Benin Republic. I'm very happy to be part of this EAI International Online Conference. My presentation topic is a multi level smart monitoring system by combining an e nose and image processing for early detection of fall one pests in agriculture. This work is achieved with the collaboration of Mr. Amojinu, Mr. Amusuga Barusi, and Mr. Asana. This presentation is organized in six sections. After introduction, we present a context and problematic of this work. Then, we analyze the current struggle methods against Fallen One and our proposed monitoring system. We end this presentation by the experimental results and discussion, and we will conclude. The West African ways benefits from a favorable climate and soil relief for agriculture. This agricultural potential allows the countries of this zone to cultivate a good number of seeds such as corn, cowpeas, rice, yams, pineapples, palm nuts, etc. But this potential is destroyed by pest attack. To control this phenomenon, several solutions have been tried, including the use of pesticides. We have proven to be 
important factors in the depletion of soils and in the soiling of groundwater. In this work, we propose a new approach to fall armyworm control and monitoring for its early detection in the field. The following one scientifically spodopterophage panda is a very active pest in Africa. It appeared in Africa in 2016 and is already present in more than 30 countries, including Benin, where it has caused significant damage to more than 80 crops, particularly maize crops. According to estimation of the Center for International Agriculture and Biosciences, the fall annual costs yields to losses of between 2.48 and 6.2 billion a year in 12 maize producing countries in Africa. Pest control plays a crucial role in farming, for without it, plants will die or not bear fruit. Farmers have to use different methods of controlling pests. Common forms of pest control involves pheromone traps usage, genetically modified organisms, natural enemies, pesticides, or a wilderness platform. By implementing one of these methods, farmers can fully maintain the soil health of their farms and agricultural produce. However, these techniques are main factors in soil water contamination and soil depletion. Have various ethical problems or leads to health complications for both consumers and farmers. Can those techniques permit an early detection? Many methods to control for are already being proposed and experts. This approach can be summarized in two broad categories, biological or biotechnological solutions and behavioral solutions. Each of them need renewal each season and can't permit early detection. In this work, we propose a multi-level architecture of a smart monitoring system for early detection of farm animal pests. This is the life cycle and behavior of the farm animal pests. We propose four levels of our detection. The earliest farms to detect the presence of fall in the field is detection a fall adult before it reach the field. If it is not reached at this level 1, it is therefore possible to detect the presence of foe in the field as soon as the intrusion occurs. The third level consists of detecting the eggs laid on the leaves. The last level of detection allows the caterpillar to be identified. The early detection level is therefore subdivided into four steps summarized in table two. The first four levels permit an early detection. The first level is high, the second is average, and the third doing low early detection. The fourth level is only a detection level because the caterpillar is inside its crop. The below diagram related the proposed algorithm of thumb Amiram multi-level detection. The diagram describes the sequence of the different action according to the monitoring system leaves. At this step, the electronic nose is used to detect the volatile and odoriferous sequences characterizing the early presence of the fall amiram. In the opposite case, where the set threshold is not reached, the latest two level of monitoring is Swift, which uses a computer vision system of image processing by segmentation of images of leaves of plants. At this stage, image segmentation can detect the presence of eggs or larvae of fall armyworm. Here we have electronic software of the fall detection system based on electronic nodes. 
This structure is in the four parts. The first is a sampling system. This part of this system is used to collect the sample of air to be analyzed. The detection system is composed of a group of sensors and signal conditioning circuits that represent the reactive part of our nose. The third part is built around a processor that whenever the sensor detects a volatile substance, a specific response corresponding to the digital measurement of the sensor is recorded and is accessible. The last part, the detection system records the data from the electronic nodes and compares them to particular signatures of the pheromone and volatile substances so to identify the presence of false amoeba. We have our approach and model formulation for image segmentation. This approach is subdivided in three main parts such as noise estimation, extraction of image characteristics which are more relevant because of sensitive to acquisition nodes, and the disease detection over image segmentation step. The result is in vector three. In global threshold algorithm, we use an arbitrary value for the threshold value. This figure, this picture shows two results obtained as image of a file M1 and it X via the also algorithm. To evaluate the proposed algorithm, we define and use two parameters, which are local consistency error, LCE, and process time PT in seconds. The measure of coherence between matching segmentation is based on two errors calculated in each pixel. The dissimilarity between segmentation result and reference segmentation is then measured by the local error and coherence. In conclusion, the fall army worm is caused to agriculture that must be eradicated. The multi level early detection technique based the electronic laws offer a better future for an ecologic, ecological fight against for army one by avoiding the harmful effect due to the use of pesticides and chemicals. Thank you for your hearing. So if uh, we don't have a question, I have one for David. And in I, I know that you guys have recommendations for the states and for the city. Uh, and of course, these uh, constructions and I mean, developing uh, tourism is important, the countries. But what makes it interesting is a na I mean, part of what makes it interesting is a nice nature that the tourism, the tourists actually are uh, visiting. So uh, what are the studies that are made to, to, to find the, 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 the best trade-off? Because uh, even when you build a new nice stuff, you were I mean, destroying part of the nature. So how people are nature conscious and uh, what kind of study they make before uh, starting developing tourism infrastructure in the in the continent and in the case of Please. the country <laughs> your video okay uh yeah thank you asan for your, yes, yes, yes. your question uh i think for the case of benin because that's what i am the most aware of uh, when we talk about tourism, uh, it has been part of the country. We have a, a history of uh, slavery. So these were uh, cultural sites, but which are now occupied by people. So the government want to restore this thing in order to uh, make more money. For the, for the people. And coming to uh, eco-tourism, I think 
it is so important, not only for the government, but also for the communities because uh, they, they practice fishing. Uh, they, uh, they fish a lot of things, not only fish, but other uh, aquatic species. So if they destroy the mangroves in their environment, they will probably end up with getting nothing more in, in the river. And also this will uh, subject them to uh, flooding events. So it's not only for the benefit of the government making money, but also in line with the, uh, protecting this community and also uh, what is good for the whole ecosystem. Okay, thank you, David. Uh, uh, Ken uh, Dr. Kennedy, you raise your hand, maybe let me give you the floor. Uh, in the advent of climate change, species of plants and animals have come about that are called invasive species. These are species that have not been there before, but it, uh, they have been favored by global warming. So I was asking the presenter or anyone else who could answer the question, whether they consider the fall armyworm to be an invasive species uh, favored by global warming, just like we're considering the recent Kenyan armyworm invasion as a possible invest, uh, invasive species. Our work is made on a uh, two fall armyworm, uh, Benin, Ami Wam and uh, uh, Burkina Faso, Paul Ami Wam. So we work uh, with uh, uh, ITA, ITA uh, Institute of Benin. And actually, we don't uh, say if our result is the same with uh, a Kenyan fall army worm. But if we have uh, our result, we can bring the uh, uh, same techniques on Kenyan fall army worm to have uh, an especially result. I think the question also relates to the fact that do you know whether the fall army worm is has been in the country that you're working in for many generations uh, or was it brought in from other production systems why what was is it a natural insect pest or is it invasive i can contribute on that and yeah yeah what yeah. i can say because i'm also from benin is that uh, uh army fall army war uh, have been there for very long. Maybe the the extent of uh, the problem nowadays is different from uh, maybe 20 years ago. I remember when I was a, a kid, I used to go to the village of my grandma. We used to see this during a rainy season, especially when the rain stopped and then you see, you start seeing them coming. So I think it is uh, something that we have been experiencing for a very long time, but maybe uh, global warming has uh, uh, made it more has um, made it more pronounced in uh, these days. David, uh, at what step are you in in your solution prototyping step, uh, and have you introduced several several number of your cooking stove? Okay, thank you, uh, Professor, for this <laughs> nice question. Uh, the, before I joined the municipality during uh, a volunteer work, they introduced some uh, uh, prototypes and uh, it was, it's a section of prototype, it's not many at the same time. So they propose something uh, to, the, to the communities and then they don't really accept it and then they moved to something else. And uh, when I was there in 2018, they proposed the, uh, uh, with the, the collaboration with the United uh, Nations Development Program, a new one. 
which uh, may uh, could be accepted by this population because it doesn't use any more the mangroves uh, uh, trees. And uh, the, the, the main input is also available in the community. So uh, from, from my point of view, I think it's, it's a good process to propose something, a product or an alternative. And then if it is not accepted to discuss it with the, the, the communities, find a way to improve it. And then if it doesn't work, go back and uh, take into consideration all the feedback uh, during the process. Thanks, David. Uh, just uh, let, let us know how much more time we have. We're, uh, we're actually running a little bit late, but I think we can have one more question. Yeah, maybe okay. one question to Mambo, one question to Amadou, but very quick questions. So Mambo, you talked about the importance of testing the, the soil before engaging constructions. Are you aware of laws actually in the continent that required those kind of tests before? And what would be your, your, your advice actually to our governments? Yes, indeed there are various kind of tests that are carried out um, uh, to assess the capacity of soil to carry a structure that is intended upon them. But um, uh, up to this time, mineralogical um, tests are not um, carried on soil because they are very expensive. I can tell you, even for us, uh, if you look, uh, I mean, I'm sure you listened to our presentation, uh, we have to carry some pool to South Africa for the X-ray diffraction test. So it's, it's very expensive. And um, because of that, uh, people don't want to go to that uh, extent. And especially for Nigeria, and over the years we've experienced uh, a lot of uh, building collapse leading to um, uh, loss of life and sometimes uh, 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 properties, you know. So that makes us to begin to look at, um, uh, in addition to uh, the usual suspects, people normally just look at the material uh, as well as the skill of um, uh, the site engineers as, as the contributing factor to collapses. But uh, I mean, our research was trying to see if there are other uh, uh, fundamental issues that uh, are usually overlooked uh, in the process of construction. And, and that is why uh, we had to look at uh, the mineralogical content. So, so already there are quite a number of uh, uh, building codes um, across Africa region that um, uh, addresses um, the need for uh, carrying out soil tests. But I can assure you for the few that I, I studied, there's nothing about the mineralogy of the soil so far. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mambo. Maybe one last quick question to Amadou to give you a chance to talk uh, to the audience. Uh, Mambo, you mentioned the difficulty of getting tests in the country. Amadou, can you tell us about your experience into getting the materials that you need to build your system? Is it something that was easily done uh, in, the, in, the, in Senegal where you are, or were you ordering from outside? And what's the perspective in terms of building things uh, in-house? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Amruba. I'm from, from Senegal. Uh, the great honor for me to participate uh, in this conference, to share with you our presentation. Uh, the main problematic of uh, implementation of our system is that we, we don't have the uh, a, a laboratory to, to develop our, 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 our controller. Uh, we just limited uh, in, in the step, we just limited on the simulation because uh, now we are in, in, in Senegal, this year, which, uh, is not uh, more developed uh, in, 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 in the validation because to validate our model, uh, we, we, are, we, we make room for uh, to travel uh, in, in France or in the other countries to validate our model. Is very very difficult. We just limit it on the simulation, uh, but we think to to we think to, to we think to we think to to, to, to try 
enjoyable and uh, why to, 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 to implement our model. Uh, before, what is the uh, advantage to, to, to validate our model? Because uh, so for all, all the countries uh, speak the, the, the independence in, 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 in energy. And we, 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 we African, we African, we must think the independence in, our, uh, in, in technology, in our, in our technology, because you know the, the all, 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 all the technology that we that, that we use in our country uh, is, 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 is from the, 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 the United States or French. Why we African? We don't to, we don't to, we don't think about our our our, our technology. And it is it will it adapt in our in our in, in our condition because we will live in, uh, in, in 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 a tropical area, and we must develop a technology to adapt in our 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 climatic conditions. That's why uh, we 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 think to uh, to develop a model that we, uh, we built in our uh, in our country with our with, with our with, with our with this condition this condition uh, climatic condition. And implement it and test it on uh, 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 experiment setup to, to to compare it with the simulation results and to be independent in technology and energy that is development and that is in perspective that thank you to to modernize our our technology. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is my contribution. Thank you very thank, much. Thank you, Amadou. I think that. Uh, yeah, I mean, this discussion is interesting, but we'll need to stop it here. I think that what the last two interventions actually alluded to, and even the previous one, is uh, the need uh, in, uh, to develop the tools that we're using within the continent. I think that we have not reached that point, and I think the research and science should uh, actually should be geared to a uh, getting to that capabilities. So maybe we leave uh, uh, with that question, how do we make sure that we are capable of developing the tools that we need and the tools that we use? Even in computer science, actually, everything is bought from somewhere else and use. So I will leave it uh, uh, leave with, with that question. And hopefully by next year, we'll see implementations of the tools that we need. So. Thank you again, David, Mambo, Arno, and Amadou. And uh, uh, Jessica will give it back to you. So now it's with great pleasure. Uh, I'd like to uh, welcome a new presenter, uh, Joey Owango. Um, if, if you can please switch on your video. I'd be most grateful, um, and I will um, welcome you to the team. Um, all right, and I'd just like to to give a little bit of overview of Joy. Joy's been very gracious to offer her professional services to our team today. Um, typically, she she this is a, a paid event which she runs. So we really thank you very much for your time and your contribution. Um, Joy is an experienced and award-winning founder director um, with history working in professional training and coaching industry. Uh, she heads, she's the executive director of the Training Center and Communication at the University of Nairobi in Kenya. And I'm sad that we were not able to meet each other uh, in person uh, with, last year. Um, she's got a lot of wide experience uh, across different sectors. She's she set up the center. Uh, she, working with a, a private intelligence agency company uh, and she successfully created foundational national access and partnerships in six countries including Kenya, Tanzania, Rwanda, Mauritius, Ghana, Senegal and Burkina Faso um, and through this she's also created government discussions and collaborations that academic and research communities uh, may access research intelligence and evidence-based research decisions and policy so welcome very much Welcome to, to the workshop, Joy, and thank you for facilitating.
Morning, everybody. My name is Joy Owango. I'm the Executive Director of the Training Center in Communication. This is a center that supports researchers, research institutes, and governments on how they can improve their research visibility and outputs through training in scholarly and science communication. We are based in Kenya and housed and in partnership with the University of Nairobi. So what I'm going to take you through today is on measuring science communication and writing opinion editorials for the policy and for policy for policy makers and also to the press. Uh, communication is about coding and decoding. And if you look at this picture, this this uh, this little girl is using dance as a form of coding to say that she is a flower. However, if you're not able to decode that information properly, you can see that the class does not understand a single thing that she's she's trying to say. So what we are trying to say is that in communication, when you're coding, it means that you need to use the right tools to help in decode the information you want to pass on. In this case, when you're talking about coding, it is the tools you use to communicate. Decoding is what information you are trying to convey. In this case, the girl is using dance to decode that she is a flower. So when you're looking at communication as a researcher, you need to ask yourself, what tools are suitable to help in passing on the information that I intend to convey? Because what does science communication entail at the end of the day? At the end of the day, as a scientist, you're looking at organized participation through a shared vision on sending your information to the government, to the community, to industry, and to fellow scientists as well. So when you're looking at all these audiences, you need to ask yourself, what kind of um, tools can I use effectively to pass on my message? And the reality is when you look at communication, it needs to, be, as a scientist, you need to ask yourself, by the time of this paper, this scientific paper, how do I translate it into a policy brief? How do I translate it into an opinion editorial? How do I translate it to a news article? Because you have already started the science communication process through writing that scientific paper. Okay, the issue is how to translate that, turn that paper into an opinion editorial or for for or um, or a news article, or even a policy document. So basically, you'll be looking at different outputs for audiences that you're targeting as well all this involves organized participation because you are you have as a scientist you have a shared vision of working with the government your community your peers and also industry so when you're looking at science communication at the end of the day communication is of science is about building bridges and this can be done through um adopting new technologies so today i can assure you none of you should be saying no, I don't. I, I do not like getting on the social media. This is measurable, and we are going to take you through how that is being done. The way you're able to measure research as uh, uh, research uh, output through citation analysis, you can actually measure um, science communication output, and this is extremely important if you want to be seen. To if you want people to know that your work is effective, the beauty about how this is measured it also shows the interaction on that output. So it's just not a number of clicks and likes, but it also shows the interaction on that output. And then it has a back record on where that science communication output came from. So in this case, that would mean that it will go back to where the original scientific paper came from. And if this was funded information, you can also get who funded that work as well. So accommodating new technologies is extremely important. Choose those that work for you and work with them very well. Because at the when you're looking at science communication it's all about engagement of your publics you don't overload them with information engage them make them understand what it is that you're trying to portray what well, make them understand your work and the best way to do that is through engaging them so they are not ignorant they may not understand the methodologies of your research but they understand the overview of what it is that you're doing so your objective as a scientist is to engage your public and when i was talking about science communication outputs are being measured. There is this tool known as Altmetric, which helps in measuring, which helps in measuring science communication output. Now, 
Altmetric, as you can see, this is a, a scientific paper on, uh, on SARS and coronavirus, and it has been cited over 651 times. The Altmetric score, that is the metric for measuring science communication output, is 46,158. And it was where it has appeared. It has been, it has this, this science communication output uh, based on this scientific paper has been in 122 news outlets, 26 blogs, it has been tweeted over 62,000 time, 62, times. There are over two patents. There are two patents. It has appeared in over 29 Facebook pages. It has been, it, there, there have been video uploads on it as well. And this is extremely important. So that means if you put it on YouTube, you create a video out of it, even at TikTok, it will be picked up. This will be picked up. So don't underestimate the power of the measurement of science communication because that is happening and donors are looking at that so they're looking at yes we gave you funding you wrote your scientific paper that is brilliant but what is the next step the next step is that we need to see the science communication output who is talking about that one and you can see the metrics are already showing that kind of information so this is something you cannot actually ignore and that leads me to our next topic, writing opinion editorials. The beauty about writing opinion editorials is because it is you who is in control of the narrative, okay? It is you as an expert talking about your work in your voice and connecting that your view or opinion to a news peg, relate a news peg relating to what your research. So when I say a news peg, it's look at what has happened this let's say this week okay so this week maybe there was a story on though we have a corona there's the, because of the coronavirus pandemic in, in kenya one of the, the things that are happening right now is that um we are we are we have limited icu beds so your opinion editorial could be based on that story limited icu beds in in uh, in in hospital in hospitals so if in health sciences or public health so your your research your your opinion editorial could be based on your research based on the fact that uh of based on the healthcare systems and the limited healthcare systems that we have in the country but you connect it you connect it to the story because the power of opinion editorials is that once they're connected to the story of the week it gives it 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 elongates the discussion okay or rather it's the discussion beyond just the news. So you're also getting the views of the experts. So when you're writing an opinion editorial, remember it is based on your opinion as an expert. Now, whenever you look at the opinion editorial in the online newspapers, uh, it is normally the opinion page. That is the opinion editorials page, okay? In the physical newspaper, it's normally on page six. It is normally opposite the cartoons. If you have the cartoons, the, the cartoon page opposite it is the opinion editorial. It is okay to clarify or correct or provide expert commentary that isn't offered elsewhere or, it's, or you want to call for further action to be done. So that is okay. It is not a letter to the editor and should not be written in that style. We'll talk about the style as well. It is normally between 800 to 900 words as well. The style should be lively provocative remember this is in your it's in your voice it should be provocative with a clear message and a transparent structure when you're reading your open it should not be hard work so the general public should enjoy reading it so when you're writing an opinion editorial you need to visualize that you're talking to your colleague about your opinion about a topical issue as an expert use that voice use that style because it becomes easier for the audience to read as well i jargon and hyperbolic or uh, righteous indignation even though you are opposing the view of your peer this is not a time for you to be self-righteous the beauty about an opinion editorial is that it is based on facts so work with that base it on facts and then you present it in your style that some in a manner that somebody can understand and enjoy um the style also is strong when you're writing use strong colorful language use memorable phrases uh, uh that will catch the editor's attention if it catches the editor's attention it also catches the audience's attention this will lend support to your argument that you're trying to present 
you what the editor is looking for the op-ed editor is looking for is clarity brevity and newsworthiness as well as controversy take advantage of all those take advantage of all those because that is what they are looking for you, you your style should also be intelligent contrarian the contrarian views expressed should be done in a unique way so that it it voice it tends to voice a positive response from the audience as well all right so you are it's assumed that you're using as i said you're an expert so that needs to come out very powerfully so that you're able to get us a positive response from your audience or just a response you need people to react to what you're you're writing the guidelines to writing an op-ed you need to track the news and opportunity so you look at the opportunities that exist and then the news that are op that exist and then you peg your opinion editorial based on those uh news uh articles or the news of the week or the news of the day that is what i'm saying you need to track the news jump at opportunity so that you can contribute by writing an opinion editorial okay um when you're writing the, the editorial the limit should be 800 words Better, the better some academic authors insist that they need more room you don't you don't need that you don't need that you don't need room to explain you need to be succinct and straight to the point and also remember that newspapers have limited space as well so they don't have the time the, the space to put in a lot of information in your or in regards to your opinion as well so when you're writing this opinion editorial make a single point and make it well okay you cannot solve all the world's problem in 800 words so in that entire topic that you're looking at, pick one and fly with that topic and make that point well. And that is why I was telling you in the beginning, right now in, in Kenya, we have limited bed space, ICU bed space in the hospitals. So if you're a health science, uh, you're a public health specialist, your focus could be just on that, okay? Uh, we have limited healthcare systems to support uh, COVID-19 focus on that you have other aspects that you could you could work on but if you focus on that particular topic it becomes slightly easier so you don't look at the whole aspect surrounding uh public health and COVID-19 just pick one point and fly with it put your main point on top okay just get to the point and convince the reader that it's worth his or a value to and time to continue reading especially when you're reading these things this opinion editorials online this is how we look at it we start from the top and we skim in the middle and then go to the bottom so make sure that your point that you want to drive home is at the top you want us to understand why this is important for us to read this opinion editorial so it needs to be very clear and you, you in the first paragraph you need to convince us why it is worth reading this opinion editorial so you have no more than 10 seconds as a person to to hook the reader okay so once you, you hook us in the, in the first 10 seconds, we'll be able to read the entire, um, the entire opinion uh, um, editorial itself, opinion piece as well. You need to make us care. You need to make us understand why, you're, why you chose to write this opinion editorial. You need to make us understand why it is important, okay? Because we are busy people. When we are reading, when it's not, yours is not the only opinion editorial that you want to read or the only thing that we are reading during the course of the day. But you need to understand why it is important that you put in you you've made the effort to write that opinion so you need to be able to answer so what who cares why should we care so when you're putting your opinion editorial that first paragraph should be should be able to answer the so what and why should we care a bit why should we be concerned okay um will it with what you with the suggestions that you're providing for example will it protect us from the disease so like in this case in, uh, if you're looking at COVID-19, the fact that there are, there are limited ICU beds, what should, why should we care? How should we protect ourselves further? So those are the things that you need to bring out. So you need to explain why you're trying to make us understand why you are writing this opinion editorial, okay? So this appeals to, unfortunately, you're dealing with human beings, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how you want to look at it, because you need to appeal to our self-interest, okay? And that is the only reason why we an effort to read your paper or your opinion editorial 
because you're looking, you're, 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 the beauty about the opinion editorial is that you're highlighting a problem or you're highlighting a problem that needs to be fixed or that needs to be, uh, that needs to be fixed or improved. You need to offer specific recommendations. It's not, it's not, an op-ed is not a new story, but simply describe the situation. So it is your opinion. So it is, so we rely on your opinion on what needs to improve or what matters need to be improved. In this case, this is when we say we rely on your opinion because you're coming in as an expert. So we rely on that to know what is it that you're, you're proposing that needs to be done. And you need to offer clear improvements. Not say we need improved policy. It needs to be improved policy in Okay, so you need to be very, very specific when you're when you're talking about what improvements and recommendations you're proposing. Um, the beauty about uh, writing an opinion is that you can also use pictures. Showcasing is better than discussing. Don't wait for polemic. Don't have polemic. Just have as many visuals as you can in in support of. Your opinion editorial. So, like, if you look at the, the press right now, they are showing pictures of limit of beds in uh, in the ICUs, or they are showing signs from hospitals saying that hospital is the hospitals are full. Showing us is better than just sitting down and discussing. So, when you are looking at writing your opinion, editorial, think of the visuals you can use. Think of the visuals you can use. If you have them, the better. Remember. We remember, as human beings, we are vain. We remember colorful details that drive facts. So you have your facts, good, which is very important. Your opinion editorial needs to be based on facts, but also top up with visuals. That gives power to your open as well. Embrace your personal voice, okay? Embrace your personal voice, because it's you who is talking. I keep on saying that whenever you're writing open, remember that it is you who is sharing your view in your voice. So make, make it personal. You, technical writing is impersonal. So an opinion editorial has to be in your voice. So you can start it, for example, with, you won't believe what I found when I was working at my lab last month. You won't believe when I, I went to Nairobi Hospital and found that um, there was a sign that there was no space in, in the ICU for COVID-19 patients. You see, use your voice. When you use your voice, the person who is reading that op-ed feels like you're talking to them, not at them with just dry facts. Now, when you're writing, use short sentences and paragraphs, okay? Cut long paragraphs into two or make them shorter. You should use the same style relying on simple declarative sentences. So just use short sentences. And the trick is look at what other opinion editorial um, uh, op -eds have, look at what other writers have done in putting together their op -eds. Of course, they're already published. So when you look at that, it will also give you an idea of how you can also structure this. Avoid jargon. I keep on saying this, avoid jargon. Use simple language, avoid technical information, especially when you're trying to pass, uh, present an argument. Always make it understandable because your audience is not scientific. Okay? It's not a scientific audience. These are laymen. It could be political makers as well and they want to understand what it is that you're trying to put forward avoid tedious rebuttals as much as you it is so easy to to respond to an opinion from another author uh within in the in the news in the media always avoid that because it looks like you are you've taken advantage of that space to have um an unnecessary fight or unnecessary engagement with this other author instead instead of having a tedious rebuttal it's okay to acknowledge and it also makes you it makes it look petty it makes you look petty acknowledge the the views of the other author even though you don't agree with them acknowledge them and then give what your opinion is against what he's he's proposing so instead of instead of um having petty arguments between yourself and another author so even if you do not agree with what they are saying acknowledge it offer a counter response but avoid boilerplate boilerplate um arguments between each of you so don't take advantage of an op of a situation where you've been allowed to write an opinion editorial and then the entire opinion editorial is fighting what the the previous um author had written about and something that maybe you are not in agreement with in the first place as i've said always acknowledge the other side you're the pro even though he's the antagonist look at yourself as a as a protagonist and make the best out of it when you're 
when you're trying to, to present your opinion, even if you do not support his arguments. Make your ending a winner. Okay, you remember how we start? 10 seconds, we're reading the top, we skim through the middle, and then at the bottom, we want to see, okay, so what are you saying? What are you proposing? So your ending needs to be uh, a, a winner. Because when you conclude with a phrase or a thought that appeared in the opening, you're able to close that entire circle. So you begin at the top, and then you connect the end with what you are saying at the top. So it is cycling. When somebody reads that, that opinion editorial, they can say, oh, wow, this is cycling. And at the same time, it ends in a, not necessarily in a positive manner, but it ends in a manner where somebody enjoys, has, has enjoyed finishing reading your, your opinion editorial. Okay? So basically, you can summarize argument with one strong final paragraph at this case as i said people start with the top they skim through the middle and then they read at the end and they read at the bottom so the bottom is like okay so what are you saying what am i recommending what am i proposing what should be done so that is what you need to see in your open at the end of the day relax and have fun because you know what you know who's writing this it is you need it is in your voice you need to make us enjoy reading it no matter how solemn the situation the opinion editorial list but when i say solemn it could be because you're in dire straits like right now with the pandemic and limited bed space in hospital so that is solemn but you need to make us enjoy reading it and understand your frustrations or maybe understand your hopes that things could be better so enjoy re uh, writing the, the the opinion editorial as i say it is in your voice don't worry about the headline that is the work of the editor are going to offer the headline you can have a running title but he's going to change it okay always offer graphics to to support you remember i said we like visuals so offer graphics graphics to support um your opinion editorial which will be used when it is published in the press submission how do you submit newspapers normally have opinion editors so get in touch with the opinion editors and follow the they will give you guidance on what the on how they want the opinion editorial submitted okay always in the newspapers if you look at the same page page six or in the opinion editorial page online you will see at the bottom there's always the, the an email to on how on, on an email to whom you need to submit the opinion editorial okay so you can submit to any of the media houses local or international never do it 3 p.m. Most media houses are in production then, so it's near impossible. Some of the large uh, newspapers will will uh, will pay you for writing opinion editorials, or and some may not do it. So always find out. And uh, most of them, most of them may not, but the bulk of them, the international ones will, and the larger ones will end up. They will pay you for the opinion editorial pieces that you put, that you submit to them. So. That's it, colleagues. Um, that's it on writing opinion editorials. Um, when we're having our discussion session, I will introduce you to some of the, the news editors, uh, local and international, who accept opinion pieces from research scientists. We are working with some of them, and uh, especially with PhD students, and they and PhD students and researchers, and they are very keen on getting opinion pieces from the from from these researchers so with that ladies and gentlemen i thank you so much for listening to me and feel free to ask me any questions or any in, in case you need any clarification regarding uh, measuring uh, science communication outputs understanding how to measure those science communication outputs and more information about uh, writing opinion editorials and also submitting it thank you so much and have a lovely day Hello everyone. Um, I hope uh, my presentation was insightful. If there are any questions, please uh, share them with me. And if there are any concerns or fears, uh, just let me know uh, so that I'll be able to share with you. I can see there's a point here by David. Um, he says science uses terminologies. Uh, let me just read that properly. 
Um, science uses terminologies that sometimes you find that the general public does not understand. Understand what would be your advice? And also, I have been I have thought that in order to engage, in order to have this, this in, it is good to use in order to engage your audience. Sometimes it's good to use shocking openings or words. Uh, uh, in your sentence. So what are my views on that? So number one, if you have the option of right of, of if you must use jargon, you must define it or you must explain it. Okay, so for example, if I say scientometrics and I just leave it in a sentence, you will get lost. How many of you understand what scientometrics is? I'm not seeing any hands up. Okay, that already is a research evaluation jargon. So if I'm going to use the word like scientometrics, I would say scientometrics and define it. It is the science of citation practice. So if you must use jargon, please define it or explain it so that somebody can understand what you're trying to, to, put, uh, to convey. Using shock therapy in, in a statement is not as powerful as when you make your statement emotive because people want, to feel your frustration, they want to feel your anger, they want to, to feel your excitement. But when you use shock, you actually sometimes put off the audience. So always visualize when you're writing an opinion editorial, you're telling that story to a friend or a colleague and you want them engaged. That should be at the back of your mind. Let's see, there's another question. Um, any other comment? Thank you, Kennedy. Is there any other question or comment? Right. Jessica? I have one question. Just, yes. Uh, in the sense of uh, your, clearly it's, you, you do a lot to develop these op-eds. Can you speak a little bit more about, um, well, maybe that's what you're going to do now. Or who, who uh, how, how precise should we be with who we're trying to target? Uh, does it depend on the, the platform of publication uh, or is there, uh, do, you, do you typically recommend that the researchers will try and target a particular end user? And um, for example, if we have, yeah, so would the, that particular end user be, for example, a, a section and a division in the municipality or would it be a broader uh, audience depending on, on the platform that we're publishing in? No, okay. So when you're when you're when you're when you're when you're writing um, your opinion editorial, you also need to look at how far and wide your audience is. So, for example, um, if it is national, in this case, if you're if you're targeting any of the national newspapers, uh, you can make it as localized as possible, even using colloquial language that they would understand. But you know, today with the convergence convergence of media, the media is already online. Okay, the media is already online. So when you're when you're talking, always have a regional, but also give a global context as well, so that the person who's going to read this online can actually under, can can actually uh, feel that they are part of the story that you're trying to to share with them. Yeah, um, I see. There's a question in the chat. Oh, the part on coding and keep decoding. What about sharing your research with local communities? Uh, here I'm talking about sharing science in local languages, exactly. So when you're looking at coding and decoding, the aspect of language does come in. So if you're looking at uh, targeting the local communities, remember decoding is, uh, decoding is the tool that you use. So in this case, if you're, if you're giving, if you're going to present, um, research findings to the local community, chances are high, you're going to either use theater, you're going to use uh, uh, community meetings. So in Kenya, if they're called barazas, so you'd have community meetings. So you find yourself either, it's okay to use local language. Bottom line is your objective is to see how you can engage your audience at the end of the day, not pouring a lot of information to them, but engaging them so that they can feel that you're part of, they're part of the conversation that you're trying to, to, to direct to them. Another question or comment? Now, uh, for those of you who've got their PhDs, I would highly recommend you get in touch with me. I'm going to send you, an, I'm sending my, putting my email address right now. All right. 
for those of you who have PhDs, get in touch with me or working on their PhDs, get in touch with me. Then I will introduce you to the editors of the Conversation Africa. The Conversation Africa are accepting quite a bit of published work and they are putting it on, they are, they are accepting opinion editorials based on published work and definitely out of um, the PhDs that you're working on. The importance of, of this is that the Conversation Africa has over a million cumulative followers on Twitter. So when it goes online, it goes to all their networks and it comes up to over a million people. This, in this case, scientists, most of them following and uh, accessing your opinion editorial. It is one of the largest platforms that you could ever use to, to, have, to publish your, your opinion editorial. So send me an email. If you're able to send me an email, I'll introduce you to the editors of the conversation. Yes, the conversation Africa, that's it, the, what, what Jessica is putting. So you will have access to the commissioning editor and you'll be able to get it. Yes. And this is purely on everything to do with Afri research on, on Africa, anything and everything that you're doing on research in Africa. But unfortunately, they only work with those who are working on their PhDs or they have finished their PhDs. Thank you so much. Unless there's any other comment, I'll hand over to Jessica. Sorry, I was muted. Yes, thank you so much, Joy. This was very fascinating and very useful, and clearly a lot of responses appreciate this. So um, we will be in touch. I know certainly it would be very useful from my perspective as well. Thanks again. You're welcome. Thank you so much, and thanks for having me. Have a lovely day, everyone. Bye. <laughs>
So if you would like to get a certificate, please fill in the form that's been posted on the chat um, and we will send this to you. Um, hopefully you didn't just attend one or two, most of the conference would be preferred. Um, uh, and I'd now like to hand over to our son to discuss the path forward uh, for Intersol. Oh, thanks, Jess. Uh, maybe uh, we'll, we'll keep the round of applause for you uh, to the end because <laughs> you you did you did a wonderful job. So I mean, this year was a really particular year for Intersol because of what happened. And as I was saying at the beginning, I mean, we were able to come back because we had a general chair who was very dedicated. So thank you just for that. Uh, the, the COVID was a big blow for us, frankly. So if, if it was not for your tenacity, uh, probably we would be lying down for some time before getting back to our feet. So thank you again. But we need to, to think of the future uh, where we go from here. So a couple of questions was raised. We will not probably be discussing everything here because we we just don't have the time, but uh, we just gonna give some ideas so, so that people can go back with them and will engage the community uh, via email. So the maybe the, the first thing is for marketing and funding. So I think that this year we did a whole, but I mean, a lot of marketing efforts actually. Thank you. We have seen a lot of movement in all social medias, uh, maybe not Facebook, but LinkedIn, uh, Twitter. Thanks for our media team. We uh, just will come back to that. But uh, we definitely need more marketing. This conference needs to be known in the continent and around the world. And uh, we need to have funding. Funding is important. Uh, we would not go through I mean, the funding hurdles that we have had, but it is very important to organize this kind of event, even if it's online, actually. We were talking about online conference, uh, reducing cost, but still there is some cost that we need to, to cover. So uh, ways actually to, to get more funding, so we are inviting people actually who could help us actually uh, get that. Of course, we have decided, and that I think that is something that we have uh, experienced in Cairo, and uh, it was a very good experience. We'll have uh, Entesol in uh, universities, uh, unless it's uh, in this kind of a setting. But when we meet in physics, we go to university. That's what we what we decided. So uh, we will be gathering ideas about getting this conference more known and getting fundings. The question also was raised about the timing. So we are going every year. Is it the best way to go? Uh, if we were to go two years, what would be done in the meantime? So we would like, uh, we will certainly engage the, 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 the community in terms of the frequency of the, of the conference. We have also decided in our previous discussion that actually to formalize everything, we need to create a, an official association uh, around Intersol. So we'll certainly start this discussion and the process as soon as we are done with this. While we prepare Intersol 2022, we'll certainly be working on creating the association and again, we need people to get involved. We need uh, more engagement. And that's really the last point. We need more engagement. I mean, organizing these type of events needs a lot of effort. Uh, people who are working on this uh, can actually uh, attest on it. I mean, Jessica in the front and people who are helping her in uh, putting together everything so uh, we, we definitely need more people in the committees to, for the organization of uh, the coming, upcoming events and uh, I mean, for the general activities around Intersol because I, we have the feeling that we can do more. 
For example, someone was asking the question about uh, uh, mentorship. Uh, for example, people who are more senior in this uh, community could be mentoring the um, and people who just get into the job uh, I mean, uh, community. So there is a lot to do. So please, please, please get in touch with us. We need the emails. Uh, uh, I mean, I think that we have already the, the registration which give I mean, a bunch of emails from everybody. So we'll be reaching out to you Please, please get engaged. We need that for the, 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 the future of this conference. So that's what I wanted to say before thanking again, Jessica. Uh, we need to thank you, frankly, for what you have done for this year's conference. Elena, who is here with us, uh, she can also uh, give a couple of words. Uh, and maybe Fadel, who was also one of the co-founder, maybe very quickly and then we give it to Mambo, and then Jess, you will have to close. So, thank, you. thank you, Hassan. Yes, uh, my turn. <laughs> so what words to say? As always, in the end of the conference, everybody is very excited and full of energy, and I hope that this kind of feeling will remain till the next edition in 2022, and the involvement as well. Asani, you've mentioned also financial part and uh, already as agreed, AI is uh, eager to um, take some of the expenses on our shoulders and we are very happy with our cooperation. I guess it's smooth and very productive. And as I already told, and I will repeat myself again, that the conference was very inspiring. Uh, the format, uh, how it was organized and of course, content wise. And uh, I want to thank all the participants and the organizing committee and the whole team, of course, for this uh, professional and very inspirational conference. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Elena. A big thanks to EA, uh, the, the European Alliance for Innovation. They have made this possible for us. So we, we thank them and we ask you to thank them on our behalf. Thank you very much. Back to you, Jess. Thank you. Um, well, I, I think I I guess I'll, I'll hand over to um, Mambo in a second. But I think while we're saying thank you, I'd also just really like to reiterate my thanks to the amazing um, committee members who've been so available the last for well, the last month really and beyond last year as well. I, I mean, there were two. Um, there was there was. There were four of us that were already in Nairobi and traveled to Nairobi for this conference and had to leave. So I'm very grateful for Seki, Amaya, um, Adam for traveling at the time. And for, um, for example, Eucharia for being on the plane at the time. I'd also really like to thank um, all the, 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 the comms team, um, Aisha, Maimona, um, David, uh, Rebecca, Adit has been an amazing help, um, Eddie, Edwin Mithoro, um, and of course, um, every, um, Adam for the publications and all the work, I find it's been a real privilege working with you and um, thank you so much for your guidance and the way that you do the um, engage in this process. Um, and of course, the, the, the chair from last year has been an inspiration and all the other people that I haven't mentioned and of course, Avi, who's done the wonderful graphics for the event. So thanks to everybody. Um, it's been a pleasure to work with you and to learn from you. Um, yeah. Okay, Mambo will be our next chair. What do you want to say? Yes, yes um, I think this, um, just like uh, Elena uh, mentioned, this, this conference has been very inspiring and um, <clears throat> a lot of it we owe it to uh, Dr. Jessica for, um, if, I, if I can use the the, 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 the word of um, uh, Asan, her tenacity uh, to bounce back in spite of all the challenges and to be able to put such a, a great um, virtual conference. I think we have a lot to, to learn from her. Uh, there is this saying in my, in my, in my language uh, that um, if a master dancer dances before you, then he give you a, a very tough assignment, something like that. 
You know, if, if, if someone who is um, 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 a master and in the thing he, he does, uh, does that thing before you, then um, it means he has given you a very tall walk to do. So um, uh, I, I'm grateful the, the whole of uh, yesterday and today was um, a learning experience for me. And um, uh, I can assure you that we'll do our best to uh, replicate, if not to do better than, than what it is so that we can take Intersol to the next level. So I'm, I'm indeed very grateful uh, uh, to participate in all the sessions and uh, learn a lot from uh, the various speakers uh, and uh, for Intersol, Hassan, um, uh, Fidel, my, my very good friend, uh, and all the other people that are so many here uh, for me to mention, I've all learned from you and I'm very grateful. Thank you.